Welcome one, welcome all. Let's go with 50%. The music here is pretty good. Welcome. I am Bridger, and today we're taking a look at Endless Space 2. Uh, you may have heard of games by this developer before. Endless Space was the first one that I heard from, uh, from these guys, and Endless Space 2 is out now, and it's basically Endless Space 1 plus Endless Legend smashed together. So let's take a look at it. It'll be partly review, partly a uh, guide to help new people understand the game, and partly a uh, playthrough. So... <clears throat> First off, I'm going to be activating th these three mods uh, because I like them. Now, the G2G Balance mod, Amplitude Studios is the company that made the game, and this is the mod where they put their balance changes that they're thinking of adding into future patches for people to test out, and frankly, they need a lot of help. Um, the base game uh, has had quite a few patches so far, and they fixed a lot of the very overpowered techs or abilities or strategies, and they're still working on it. But this is their next attempt at balancing various mechanics in the game. Anomaly uh, Immersion basically makes it so that you won't have a weird monsoon anomaly uh, on a desert planet, for example. Um, that's kind of the only thing it changes is a few things like that that make it, you know, so anomalies are a little bit weird. Um, and then this just makes everything look kind of interesting color-wise. So let's jump into it here. Endless Space 2 is a 4X space strategy game, as you probably can tell, of explore, expand, exploit, exterminate. Explore, exploit, expand, exterminate. I never remember which order those are in. Exterminate's at the end, though. So, here we are. Uh, I do want to point out one quick thing. Uh, this UI is fantastic, by the way. And one of the things that I do highly suggest is you jump in here and change the tooltip, which I think defaults to, like, uh, oh no, here it is. Okay, the tooltip delay can be whatever you want. The progressive tooltip, I'll turn this down to probably 0.7. Uh, and that, eh, 0.6. Uh, it's, it's, I, I, I like having the more information sooner. So, uh, when you go to make your game, you got a bunch of different options here. And to be honest, I suggest one of a few specific races for new players. Because they all, a lot of them have a very unique and maybe confusing mechanics if you're brand new to the rest of the game, whereas the following that I'm going to give to you are all fairly straightforward and feel similar to a lot of other uh, races in other games. So the United Empire is the first one that I would suggest. It is your typical space tyrant situation, uh, and their bonus is real easy. It's just whenever you produce stuff with your hammers, uh, equivalent if you're from civilization, uh, then you get some extra influence. Hey, that's cool. Um, and that's it. You start with some other cool stuff and you can colonize more things before running into unhappiness problems. So you don't have to, this is all like passive stuff. You don't have to actively worry about what these bonuses are. They'll just help you no matter what, right? Okay. So that's why I recommend the United Empire. They're still really fun to play, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that they are not cool. Uh, I think they are great for new players, and I, they're probably my preferred uh, playstyle as well, because they are all about uh, being a space tyrant and conquering other peoples and doing whatever you want and expanding into the galaxy. Now, maybe you don't like the whole military aspect, but you also want something that's not too dissimilar from other games. Uh, the Lumeris are basically the space mob. They're like the mafia, right? They... they are all about money and business. It's all about business. Uh, and their bonuses, basically, they get to use dust to do things instead of uh, influence or colony ships, which is pretty cool and real easy to understand. Like, oh, hey, this stuff costs dust instead of other stuff. So, um, yeah, these guys are fairly easy and straightforward to play as well. So I would recommend one of those two. United Empire, if you want a more... Uh, combat focused and Lumeris maybe if you want a more economy and growth focus. Uh, so we're going to pick the United Empire and we're going to jump into it. There's a couple of sub menus here which can be very valuable. Uh, I'm going to have the game difficulty on hard for myself. Uh, time management, great for multiplayer options uh, here. You can set turn timers 
that are only on, you know, uh, either all players have to do this much and then you either get extra per stage or whatever, or you can just say, okay, uh, the last player has a turn timer, so once everybody else is readied up except for one player on a given turn, then they get 45 more seconds. There's a bunch of different options here for turn timer. Really like the multiplayer opportunities. Um, animation speed, I put it on times two. This is for how fast the animations are for like ships moving around and things like that, but anyway. I leave most of this on default, but that gets us to the beginning of describing the game. Uh, and you know, I don't have the chat open, so nobody can respond to me, and that's no good. So we'll pull that up for you. Right now, let's talk about the victory conditions. The victory conditions in this game are similar to most other games that you have probably played, uh, including Civilization and Stellaris and other things like that. Um, so score victory, yeah, if the game uh, ends a certain number of turns and whoever has the most uh, score wins. Not going to happen most of the time because one of these other victory conditions is going to trigger. Either you capture all the enemy's capitals, just like in Civ V, uh, or six, or if you bring a certain percentage of star citizen systems under your control, uh, but you can't get that last capital, you'll still win if you get enough, right? Um, and then, there we go, and then a science victory is you have to research all four victory technologies to win, and those cost a lot of science. And while you're doing that, of course, you're probably not getting other types of uh, technologies which are valuable uh, to protect you from encroaching enemies or people working for an economic victory. Economic victory is just the most dust, which is the money, the gold, whatever you want to call it, over the course of the game. If you can generate enough of it, you can win. So this is like generate as much science, uh, generate as much dust. I think this is easier to learn than Endless Legend. Uh, thanks, Fish Food Master. I believe it's easier to learn uh, than Endless Legend in part because the Space 4X elements share more in common with other games you have probably played, um, like Gal Civ, Master of Orion, um, Stellaris, uh, any, any other uh, Space 4X games are probably similar. Endless Legend did some very interesting things with the development of cities and such, uh, as well as the heroes and the tactical battle system, which was a little bit uh, beyond the pale, uh, but I really liked it for a lot of the things that it did. Um, and finally, the wonder victory is actually like build as many production points as possible in a number of your systems. So it's like this is a big victory focused on production, uh, economic uh, dust production, uh, science production, and conquest. So we're going to leave all those on. Just move on to the game. Uh, there are a couple other settings I do want to mention. Constellations are the star systems that are connected at the very beginning of the game by travel routes. I call them jump points. I'm not sure what they actually call them in this universe, but uh, that is if you have the galaxy as unique, every single system in the game will be connected to every other system. It might just take a couple of other jumps to get there, but there will be connections. You can see the connections in the back here by, indicated by those lines. Few means that some constellations, groups of star systems that are uh, connected by lines, will not get you connected directly to the rest of the star systems until you research a certain technology to get there. So I leave it on few. It makes the map a little bit more interesting, I think. Now we're going to get our cool intro, and I think they did a fantastic job with these intros, especially the voice acting. Of all of them, I like this one and the Lumeris intro is also fantastic. It definitely gives a Godfather Under feel. the visionary leadership of Emperor Zelovus, we have become a proud and powerful nation. It is time to rise up, grasp our future, and seek our destiny among the stars. Imagine the future that we can build. We shall construct great fleets, send them out to make great discoveries, and through their conquests, secure our place in this rich galaxy. That really gets you in the mood to play this specific Civ, right? It's all we like... New sciences. Obviously, it's, it's the and dictatorial space conqueror as painted by their propaganda, right? This is the best possible light to paint the dictatorial space conqueror. <laughs> and look, we have even these alien servants that are totally happy to serve us, and then all of their friends, we totally killed them. <laughs> it's definitely up there uh, with, like, as far as satire goes. I mean, it's obviously not... Uh, see, because here you see, 
this is what reality is. We just saw the propaganda version of this empire. The reality is it's like, you know, it's a class-based society where the upper class believe in this, you know, version of reality with the propaganda thing. And, but really, life's not as great as they portray. Okay, so here we are. First, let's just take a look. We got some notifications on the right-hand side of the screen. And I'm going to try to jump through this stuff as brief as possible because nobody likes over-explaining stuff. Uh, so it does feel a little bit North Korean, doesn't it? Uh, but w much more well produced, I would imagine. Um, so when every turn finishes, you'll see a list of things pop up on the right here, which are your notifications for the turn. Sometimes they'll pop up in the actual middle of the screen, sometimes not. So let's go through these one at a time real quick. Uh, we gained a new hero. I'm going to talk about them later, so let's put that aside for now. Uh, we now, this is just the little intro for your faction. Hey, look, here's your guy, here's your little, this is your motivation, right? What's my motivation? There's your motivation, right here. If you click this button, you get more information about your faction and the power. Uh, you get more influence than normal, and you can use that influence to buy all kinds of things from uh, the other factions in the game. Uh, so that's pretty cool. It also tells you about the other things that you have going on for you here, which, again, mostly passive. We'll talk about them when it becomes necessary. So, at the beginning of the game, you learn about a couple of uh, resources, luxury resources, that are available to you. I should point out, by the way, this checkbox up here, if it's on, it means at the beginning of every turn, if this type of window would normally go over to the right here, it would instead pop straight up and be in your face. Uh, most of those you just want to leave on default, or if you don't like something popping up, you can turn it off there. Uh, so, uh, you can also scroll through these things on the right with this button in the top here. This button will go through all of the uh, things on the, on the right. Now, another cool thing, because this company, Amplitude, makes the most beautiful and functional UI systems ever. Anytime you're in any menu, right-click to get out of it. Brilliant. Now it minimizes in this case, uh, so you can right click on the right to make them go away. But let's just say I go to this menu and then I were to open up another menu. If I want to go back to the previous one, right click. If I want to go back to this, no, right click. Just right click. No matter which menu you're in, you go back and you right click. If you go to this menu and then I go to inspect and then I go to this, right, right, right. And I'm back where I started. You don't have to find the back button somewhere in the bottom corner where it's different in every game. It's beautiful and I wish more games would use it because nobody uses a right-click menu in their strategy games. Right-click is completely ignored and unused. Make it your back button, rant over. Okay, so let's first explain the economy of the game because you start out with your one system here and you can see we're in a sort of spiral galaxy. I think I left it on random, but it looks like we're in a spiral galaxy in this case, which means you're more likely, and it looks like a two-armed spiral galaxy you can see. Sometimes you can have more or less. We're most likely going to find star connections along these arms, much less likely to find the star connections in the middle here. That's what the galaxy uh, design implies. Um, so what's interesting here is uh, you can see diplomacy scan versus trade scan versus economy scan. We got a couple of different levels of, and this is by the way space in the main uh, button lets you zoom in and you can see the things on the left kind of change depending on how far out you're zoomed. And those are really cool and we'll get to them when they make more sense. Right now we've only got a single uh, system under our control. We've got a nice blue star system here and we can hover over it to get a bunch of details in the bottom left. Let's zoom in a little more when you click on it. So, in Endless Space 2 and in the previous Endless Legend, you have a concept known as FIDSI. F-I-D-S-I. And that is food, industry, dust, science, and influence. These five resources are what you're going to be managing throughout the game. I should point out there's one more resource, manpower, that you can see at the top of the screen here. Uh, and another piece of manpower can be seen here. And I'm going to talk more about manpower later when we go over the military stuff. But mostly, you're looking at these five resources. That's what gets produced on your planets. So, if we take a look at this planet, we can hover over it and learn that this is a Terran planet. It is temperate and fertile. Those are keywords 
that might have some effect, but the tooltip system in this game is fantastic. If you hover over tempered, it says, oh, it offers conditions, blah, blah, blah. Because there's no other items than this flavor text, you can know that there's nothing you inherently gain from this keyword, temperate. And what's more is to help keep the UI nice and clear, if you're not hovering over that planet, temperate is simply represented by this nice little sun. And fertile is represented by this fish. And sterile is represented by this fish. And cold is represented by this. So you can easily look at this and understand the iconography after a few games, because when you hover over it, you can easily see what they are. Again, nothing inherently gained by the word temperate or fertile. However, uh, I will show you exactly, here we are. This is what's called a system improvement. You can think of these like buildings in Civilization, uh, the Civilization series, right? So in these guys, uh, with these guys, uh, this building in particular, it produces plus 10 industry, that's like your hammers, per planet, period. So each planet that's colonized in this system will get plus 10. If we were to colonize all four of these planets, we'd get 40. Now, each of these planets that is colonized and also fertile gives us an extra 10. And each planet that also has the temperate keyword gives us an extra 10. So if we were to build this, we would immediately get 30 because this is a planet, it's fertile, and it's temperate. If we then also colonize the boreal, we'd get another 10 for it being another planet and another 10 for it being fertile etc etc you get the picture so cold planets good for science hot are good for production sterile are good for dust and uh, c dust collection in this universe dust is this su substance that's scattered across the galaxy on planets and on uh, Terran type planets a lot of seasons and weather the dust sort of gets spread out amongst the planets by the weather and it's very hard to collect so you don't get a lot of it whereas on a sterile planet where there's rare life and not much rain or anything like that you get collections of dust that can be easily mined and harvested and used as money so uh, first, let's ex examine how these things produce the food, the industry, etc., etc. If we hit the space bar, or in my case, it's the tab button, that opens up the system management scan. Uh, so I click on that, or you hit the space bar on your game. Uh, and you can see, this shows us how much of each resource the planets will produce per population point. So on our little home world here, each population point produces eight food, four industry, six dust, and four science. Uh, and if we go back here, you can see we have three population points, and if they're all producing eight food, oh, bingo, we get 24 food. And if we get, you know, four times four, uh, four times three, rather, we get 12, etc., etc. Now, this two influence here, well, you look at that, we didn't actually make any influence inherently on the planet by the population production. Instead, this says it's plus two from, and then it gives us a weird symbol. Well, that symbol is actually uh, these, this particular political, uh, sorry, race, the Imperials themselves. It actually looks weird when it's like this, but that symbol right there is the same as this little symbol on this guy here that I'm dragging around. So this race of peoples, our race, the Imperials, for each population point on a planet, that planet produces one influence. This is another sub-race that we have living on our planet, and each of them produce extra manpower. That's what the person with the ball symbol is. It's manpower production. Um, specifically, it's garrisoned production on the planet here. That's what the, the person plus little ball, I think, is actually supposed to be a planet. So that's garrisoned manpower, which acts as your defense should the planet be invaded. So that's how you can think of that resource there. So uh, you can see we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight total slots on this planet. And it's important to understand, and thanks to the nice tooltip systems, we can see that these red slots here will start generating unhappiness if they get filled up. So ideally, when we're growing this system, we want to get two more slots filled up, and then we want to colonize a new planet and have people grow on that one so that we don't get the negative penalty. Eventually, the whole system is going to be uh, colonized, and we'll have to build buildings like the infinite supermarkets to increase happiness in other ways. So that is the basic production of things on this menu. You can also see on the left 
we get the name, which we can click on if we wanted to change it. Dorado, uh, El Dorado. Get it right. Uh, so we can see that. You can see right now it costs 20 dust to upkeep, to pay, to keep the buildings in this system going. If we click on the button next to that, you can see all the constructions that have already been built. In this case, we have the colony base. Every single uh, system that you colonize gets a colony base. So it always starts by default at plus 50 approval, which is straight in the middle. 100 is the best, zero is the worst. And it starts with an extra juice of food, production, influence, and it converts 10% of your food to manpower automatically. So every planet you ever colonize does that. You can increase that amount if you are being more militaristic and you need it. Uh, the Galactic HQ is the one thing that starts in your very capital. You can't ever make another one of these, but it gives you extra dust and science to get you kickstarted and, and influence at the very beginning of the game. And we cannot scrap these, so we can't use this button. But if we were to build more of these things, they would show up in here. So let's hover over drone networks. This produces 10 food and 10 production, which are great things when you're trying to escape from being only a one planet species. We need food for growth and we need production to get more of these buildings built. So I always start with drone networks. Another great one to start with is cerebral reality because it gets you some science, which is good, and it gets you dust and it does not cost any extra dust to upkeep. Drone networks has an upkeep cost of two dust, which is not a lot, but we're only making 28 period over the course of the uh, uh, of everything we have, and so an extra two is it's not an insignificant amount. So we're going to start with drone networks, and we'll come back. Um, now you'll notice this faction. One of their special abilities is that they can buy out, as in complete, the production of buildings with influence. This is a special power of this faction. Other factions don't get to do this. Kind of cool. Influence is used for a lot of things. This faction builds extra influence thanks to their racial power and thanks to the uh, other production situation. But anyway, this is going to take us five turns. We can see it's going to give us these things. It's going to cost 160 industry. We're doing 37 industry a turn. It does the math, says five. Boom. Um, and because we have the special emperor's willpower, when we complete this, it will convert 20% of that industry into influence for us, which is what the plus 16 star means in the bottom corner. All right, let's see. Is there anything else on this left side we can talk about real quick? Well, this automation policy, if you want to, if you have so many systems that you don't want to deal with building all the things in them, you can say a governor, oh, focus on food for this one, or focus on dust for this one, or focus on science for this system. And it will go and build the appropriate buildings and assign the people to the appropriate planets, etc, etc. I don't like to automate unless I get really big, so we can ignore that. Um, underneath that, you can see our population information. It says we have three people in this system, three population points, and in seven turns, we're going to get a new population, and it's going to be of the type Imperial. The type that you're going to get is randomly chosen as soon as you're ready for a new population point. Uh, so as soon as we finish getting this Imperial, it will decide, do you get an Imperial or do you get a uh, Hisho? And it also tells you that they are content, and it says that being content has no effect. If your people are really happy, it will produce more food and influence. If they're not, it'll produce less. Down here is all about the political system, which we're going to get into later. Finally, we have the governor, and we're going to pick the hero that we started the game with as our governor. First, let's take a quick look at him and determine what he does. He can be assigned to a fleet in which he gets his own personal hero ship to be uh, essentially part of that fleet. Or he can be assigned to a system as a governor in which he provides certain bonuses as a governor. His starting skills are plus 5% production on the system and plus 5% hull plating absorption if he's assigned to a fleet. So we're going to assign him to our capital system for now because his hull plating isn't going to be ter terribly valuable while we're exploring. It might be valuable later if we have to fight somebody. So we're going to go, again, right click to go back, and we're going to click him and confirm he is now a level one hero, and he is governing this system. Now, he will level up over time, and we will be able to spend skill points to level him up in these different categories, and we'll look at that later. Uh, he's also costing us, by the way, two dust per turn. So it is costing us to use him, and higher uh, level heroes cost more dust, and we can get more heroes, and we'll get to that later. Okay, we're basically done looking at this for our first turn. Now, there's one other bit that we're gonna need to take a quick look at before we hit the next turn button. And that is we start the game with a settler uh, 
and a patrol. This is a scout. You can tell it's a scout because it's got the little eyeglass, uh, magnifying glass. And you can tell this is a settler because it has a little flag. Now, we've got a couple of different options. We could immediately settle, I believe, this boreal colony with this settler. Um, no, it won't let us do that. They, that was something we used to be able to do because this system's already colonized. You can't do that anymore. Old game. Okay. So we're going to need to go exploring. Now, these uh, ships are currently uh, in two different fleets down here. You can see we've got one fleet here with five movement points. That's what the arrow means. And another fleet with six movement points. The patrol ship has six movement points. You can also see that it is currently using one of four command points in that fleet. So we can combine these two fleets if we wanted to. We click one and then control click the other or shift click and you get merge. Now it's the same vessels together and they can move as a fleet. Whenever you fight a battle, it's fleet versus fleet. If you have four fleets in the area, it doesn't matter. Only one of them is fighting at a time. That's all you have the logistics capacity for. So that's how this works. But we're going to split them up again. So we click on one of these and say we're going to create a new fleet. And you can see there's a bunch of other options here. Select all, assign a new hero, heal them, scrap them, etc. So we flip them out again. Another option you can do is disband them, which sends them to the hangar. So now instead of being their own fleets, they're now in this hangar and you get access to that hangar by clicking on the little hangar icon here. And we can, cr again, create the fleets we want. The advantage of keeping things in the hangar is generally, I believe it requires no uh, upkeep to uh, do that. That's how it was in the previous games as well. Anyway, I haven't checked it yet for this one. But in the beginning of the game, it's relatively harmless to just send your exploration and your settler ship out into the galaxy to find out what's going on. So that's what we're gonna do. The last thing we need to do is take a quick look at technology and I'm just gonna pick one for us and then head back and move on. And we're gonna come back to technology soon. So stand by. Another cool thing we can see on this map is that this system has titanium and hyperium. Those are two of the six strategic resources in the game. Strategic resources in the vein of Civ V, like iron or horses. You need them in order to build specific buildings and military modules for your ships. Uh, so what that means is if we zoom in a little closer here, you can see, ah, El Dorado III has a poor deposit of titanium. It only gives us one titanium per turn. And it has a average deposit of Hyperion. And you can also see in the bottom left that these just being on this planet mean that every population point on the planet gives us an extra science and an extra industry. So that makes this planet extra good. Moving on. We've already sent our ships out. Uh, we hit the turn button. However, they're not moved yet until we tell ships to execute their planned moves which they will automatically do at the end of the turn if you don't press that button. We found a new minor civilization. So let's take a quick look. Uh, so we discovered this system over here, and we discovered this system over here, which is a minor civilization. This is a concept taken from Endless Space, uh, sorry, Endless Legend, and it's also similar to the city-states of Civilization V. Although in this game, you can, like in Endless Legend, get them to assimilate into your empire, and they will become de facto the same as your controlled areas, unlike Civ V. Becoming their allies makes them part of your empire. So in order to interact with them, we click on their little icon here, and we can see that, okay, this is the pilgrims. They like, uh, you know, they, they typically produce more dust than other factions. That's their racial bonus. And they have this faction trait, plus five per anomalies on colonized planet systems. That's kind of cool. Okay. Their effect on planets, if they're there, is this. Good. Their political output is this. Great. Our current uh, things that we could do with them is neutral. Now, how you can interact with them is, of course, on the right-hand side. If you want to conquer them, you have to spend some influence to do it. That's kind of like influence you can think of as political power and diplomatic power combined. So you have to sway the folks back home and say, hey, we need to go to war to do this. I need uh, the support of my military generals. I need the support of these guys, and it's going to cost me some influence in order to start this war. And if you conquer them, then they will act just like any other planet that you've conquered. Uh, or you can praise them for a while and get them to like you. If you get them to like you by praising them, uh, then they will start giving you uh, trade in the form of dust and science, which is great. Uh, and if you want their faction power, uh, then you can 
use this option down here, which requires us to pay some luxury resources, which we don't have. And if you want to assimilate them peacefully, you can assist them by giving them, uh, asking them for a quest. And they will give you a quest. If you complete it, they just, boom, they join your, your faction without declaring war. Cool. What else did we learn? Well, you can see this little ping, right? Every couple of seconds, there's a little ping coming from one of these planets. The brown one, by the way, that's filled in means that it's colonized by this brown faction. The non-colored in means it's not colonized and not colonizable. If we go back and look here, the white circle means it's colonizable with our current level of technology, but not colonized. If it was colonized, it would be blue. The blue with a circle around it means it's a unique planet. It's unique because it's our capital. And over here, you can see two empty planets because we don't know how to colonize those types of planets. So let's go back to this here. This means, and if we zoom in here, we're gonna get a nice little, oh yes, the data, it comes up. Uh, and it tells us information. We have an ice planet here. You can click to move through them a little faster. And here we go. You only see that the first time you click on it and you can go right through. So you can see that these guys are on the ice planet. They've colonized it and it's producing this much stuff. Now, also, we can see that, oh, this medium arctic planet has a little symbol here. If we hover over it, oh, it's a long season, it's an anomaly, and it's a detrimental one. Detrimental ones always are in this, like, reddish-brownish color. And it's giving us those effects, minus dust, minus food. Ugh, that's bad. And if we look over here, we see a positive effect, a positive anomaly, that because it is green. And it gives us plus four science per person, and it's a huge planet. If we have a huge, we can see its maximum population is six, and the per person output is 16 science, four dust. That's it, no food. Well, that's kind of problematic, but that's a lot of science. This area, because it has three cold planets, is gonna be amazing for science generation. Which you can kind of see this, this little bar here gives you a bar graph, gives you a general idea of what these planets are good for. Lastly, we have an unexplored and unknown curiosity. In this case, this curiosity type is ruins. You might also see subterranean, atmospheric, life, etc. There's, I think, four or five different types. Now, if we controlled this planet, we could queue up an exploration of this curiosity as a building type. So if we were back in our own thing here and there was a curiosity, which actually there is a curiosity here, it's a subterranean curiosity, but it's currently locked because we don't have the technology to explore it yet properly. But if we did, we could click on this and it would appear down here like a building and we'd just spend our industry to look into it. But because we are not in control of this system, we can still explore it because we have a scout here. So we can click on this and he will use one of the two probes that he has currently in his uh, arsenal. You can see two of two at the bottom there with the probes. We're gonna click on that and find out what did we find. These are like goody huts in civilization. Oh, the analytical engine, a unique dust improvement. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly what it does, but it's now, oh, it's on the planet. It's not, a, it's not something we can build, is it? Or maybe it is. Yeah, it says a unique improvement. If that's something that shows up here. It is, look at that. So we can build this. And what does it do? Can only be built once per empire. Cost, political impact, upkeep is six. Um, you know what? I think this is bugged. Because it does not appear that this does anything. Its effects are nothing. Utilizing remote sensors, the engine somehow instantaneously extracts valuable dust production data from any explored curiosity sites. Supplementing dust production. Oh, okay. Well, I think the tooltip may be broken because it says it does nothing. All right, well, there you go. So, we've explored that. We've gained some little thing that we can maybe, maybe not use. Another thing you can use probes for is you can launch them. You can see there's a little slightly subtle texture here. When we sent our scout, he has a large vision, so he cleared both areas on the side of this uh, jump lane. But all of this area still is invisible to us. Uh, invisible. Invisible. We can't click here. I can't tell my scout, hey, go look in here. He can only go along jump lanes at the beginning of the game. But I can tell him to send a probe. Hey, go down there. Now, for five turns, that probe's going to go out in that direction, and we're going to reveal that. In that might give us valuable information. Cool. Good to know. We'll send our scout deeper into the space in this direction on the next turn, and he's going to go that way. Meanwhile, we found this other planet, small lava, 
Very good for production. Hot planet's good for production. Arid planet, also hot, but also inhospitable. So we don't know how to, uh, how to properly build off of these, and we cannot probe them. We can't explore them because we don't have a scout ship here. So, unfortunately, the mysteries of what's going on here will remain mysteries to us, and we'll send our uh, settler ship down one more jump lane away from our home world. If we don't find a planet we can settle in this direction, let's send it back and send it down this lane. So, there we go. End turn. Again, we can buy out this technology because we are this special faction. We can buy it out with influence. It looks like, oh, and we're going to the same place. So, that's disappointing. But, this is a system which does not have any colonizable planets. Instead, if you grow your influence ring, you see this blue ring that denotes my territory, if you grow that ring to encompass this system, then the system that encompassed it first gets plus 50 dust! Whew. That's a nice bonus. So if we were to get the Ying as allies, and they grew to encompass this system over time, then they would get that nice bonus applied to their system. Now how do you grow this ring around your planets, uh, your systems? Well, it's actually linked to the total influence production ever produced on that planet. So it's a running total on, sorry, on the system itself. So as this system produces more influence, it will grow. If you produce more influence faster by building specific buildings and specializations, then this circle grows faster. All right, and that allows you to encompass things like this. It also protects your territory and lets you see further, etc., etc., etc. So we're going to send our settler back over here because currently there's nothing for him to settle in this direction. Uh, and you know what? I'm going to wait with my scout here one more turn because the probe is going to uh, has one more turn. You see, cooldown one turn means it's going to get a new probe stock in one turn. So I'm just going to wait one turn here, and then we'll get another probe and we'll send it out into the galaxy to see what it finds. We'll send it down in that same direction to try to cover most of this area with the probes. And now we can send our scout back home and have our settler move through. And we're done. We're going to the next turn. Now, you can see that these two Hyperium... Oops, sorry. Here's our first quest. So, there are a number of different quests that appear in the game. Some of them are solo quests, just for you and your faction, and some of them are competitive multiplayer quests, where you and the AI are competing to do something, and sometimes it's like a team effort, where you choose one side or the other, and then the teams try to achieve objectives that are 180 degrees opposite from the opposite team, and you have to might lead you into some fighting. All right, so this is the story of what's happening to your Emperor guy here. And there's some really cool flavor in this. If you just click through this and look down at the stuff on the bottom, you're missing a lot of cool stuff. So uh, this is all about the fact that there's some faction planning a civil war, a coup against you, right? Um, and it's partly because, uh, let's see. Yeah, you think, we're unsure. There was some major accident. It might have been an accident. Maybe it was planned sabotage. We don't know. And so we're going to try to find the perpetrator, and you're going to choose how you're going to find them. You're going to try to either do it by uh, locating 10 curiosities. In that case, we'll get this, which is a plus 40% food on our outposts, which are our brand new colonies uh, before they get upgraded to a full colony. They're called outposts. So that helps all of our colonies grow faster. Or if we can stockpile 600 dust... We get a free outpost uh, in Traitor's Reach. I'm not sure where that is, but that might be interesting to find out. Or we can intimidate them if we can reach 800 manpower total in our empire. Uh, if you remember, I told you that manpower is accumulated on an empire-wide basis and on an individual system basis for garrisons. Punisher Drives is an empire improvement. That means we don't have to build a building. It's not a system improvement. It's an empire improvement. For the rest of the game, we get plus 10% damage on our ships. That's really good. But at the same time, I want to find out what this is, because I haven't, I haven't ever seen that before. So we're going to do that and see what happens. Bribing, so that means we need to stock up 600. We're doing 26 a turn. It's going to take a while. 
So we'll see. Sending our ships home. Our scout is going to get here a little faster because he moves faster, if you recall. By the time he gets there, he's probably going to have some of his uh, probes back. We might use them. There we go. Let's uh, look in this general vicinity. You see we're revealing that scattered backdrop. And that's it. Ah, El Dorado has finished constructions of the drone networks that we built earlier, and now they have an empty construction queue. I do usually like to follow up drone networks with Cerebral Reality, again, because it doesn't cost any upkeep. It actually produces dust for you. Another option in this case could be Xeno Industrial Infrastructure. It will help us build all other buildings and things faster. And because we're going to want to build a bunch of scouts and settlers, I'm going to build that first. Uh, so then I might build the Cerebral Reality. In fact, it'll build much faster once we have an extra 30 production. It's going to increase our production by about 40%. And we're about to get a new population point here next turn, which will give us more production as well as other things. All right, so we sent away that probe. Let's send our scout this way, looking for other connections. This, by the way, is all part of one constellation. You can tell because of the connected jump points. Uh, okay. So, this is an important con uh, concept. We just finished researching a technology. And this menu tells us, hey, this is the technology you just finished. Here are the newly unlocked things. This symbol represents a system improvement. These are your buildings. It kind of looks like buildings, right? There you go. So, just like that other building we had that was giving us a lot of production, this one will give us a lot of science. It also allows us to colonize a new type of planet, Tundra, instead of uh, Mediterranean or Terran or something else. We can now colonize Tundra. Uh, in addition, um, the bottom of the screen here shows us that we have some new options and these are the ones suggested, but we're going to go to the technology screen because something else just happened, which is very important. Let's go up here to the military side. You can see that the technology wheel is separated into four branches, military, Empire development, science and exploration, and economy and trade. We're going to take a look at the military one to begin with. You can see that within the military one, we have one, two, three, four, five tiers of research. The further you go out, the more expensive they get. Out here, it costs 6000 to research one tech, and down here, it costs 152 So it ramps up. In addition... Every technology you research makes every other technology more expensive. So you can't just say, I'm going to get everything eventually. Because, no, you're not. You're going to have to pick and choose. Some things, if you don't really need it, it might not be worth picking it up because it's just going to make everything else more expensive. So this lock indicates that we can't research anything in the second phase until we have researched at least one thing in the first phase. And if we look down here, you can see we have already researched this and so all of tier two is unlocked. In fact, that's what this message was. It was saying, hey, you just unlocked a new technology stage. Not only does that give us access to four new possible technologies, it also unlocks all the things in this box. And it unlocks this diamond. These are two separate things. This box gives us access to two support modules that we can put on our ships. You can see in the bottom left, if we hover over them individually, you can see this is a support module that allows you to get three movement points instead of two on your ship drives. This is a module that allows you to get extra armor, well, extra health, and it also repairs your ship after each battle. So these are support modules. You get them simply by researching all the lock symbols from the previous stage. It's because the previous stage is always one lock to get into the next stage, uh, we have already researched, um, we start the game with the research here and here, so we start the game already having access to the stuff in stage two here and stage two here. Now, what is this? These diamonds are essentially a race. Every diamond you see in every stage um, of all of these trees is a race. This diamond is be the first to successfully search 10 curiosities. If you succeed, you get 60 of that particular luxury resource. If we hover over this, it says it's Ducidious Trees. Dust, it, dust, dust, 
deciduous trees. Yeah, I see what you did there. Uh, so if we research 10 curiosities first, we get this cool thing. So we've just unlocked a special race. Or be the first to have three unique star system improvements in your empire. If you do that, you get 75 titanium. Or be the first to build the wonder endless research park and endless world. Once you unlock this stage, that wonder becomes buildable by you. And you can see in this case, it costs 2,300 industry, 10 titanium, and 10 hyperium. And the red indicates that we don't have enough of those resources to build that thing. While we're talking about color, let's talk about how freaking... You remember how I said before the UI was brilliant? The UI is brilliant. The UI is brilliant. The color in this game is so well crafted. If you're looking for anything here and you're trying to figure out what you need to do, God, my food is a problem. My planets aren't growing fast enough or this system has a real problem with food. I need to figure out how to get more food. Well, food is green. If we go over here, oh, these things are green. Let's hover over this. Oh, hey, these are food improvements. And hey, look, these are food improvements. And hey, those military things are red. Let's, oh yeah, these are military. Military, everything up here is military. And the color of this shield represents the uh, color of the resource in question. So this is uh, antimatter. Antimatter's colored this orange color. And so the shield is orange because it takes antimatter to build this shield. And hey, it takes titanium to build this shield and hyperium. And I can tell you that and I can I can rivet off what all of these things are because they're color coded and it's great. It's amazing. Okay. Anyway, uh, that having been said, uh, this blue color is for colonization and movement on the empire map, uh, exploration basically. So this light blue is colonization, uh, exploration of curiosities, and map movement. The yellow color is uh, specializations for the planet. Actually, it's a yellow green because it's a food, so that's why. Uh, you'll see other ones that are different colors, but this is food, food, um, etc. Um, then you'll see other colors like dark purple is anything to do with influence. Light pink is anything to do with happiness. Uh, again, these colors here that the modules are colored are specific to those types of things. Yellow is dust related. This light orange is industrial related. Uh, it's it's brilliant. It really is. And then this blue is science. This darker blue is science. Um, so yeah, I can't get over how awesome the coloring is in this game. And the symbols help you out even more because if you're looking for a bonus that you don't have to build, this is an empire-wide bonus. Every planet gets plus five for the rest of the game. You don't have to build a building to make that happen. It's across your entire empire. This is a building. You have to build it in each of your systems in order for it to apply to that system. This is a unique building, which is why it has a little empire symbol in the background. It's, it's amazing. Okay, so we talked about how you unlock these things and you unlock these races. These little things kind of look like they have in other games where you're required to do one before the other. Not true. You can click on this and research this even though you haven't researched rare earth foams. However, uh, these indicate that it's a facilitating tech and facilitating techs reduce the cost of the techs that come after. Brilliant. So. Since this allows us to colonize Mediterranean, which is a pretty damn good planet, and not too rare, we're going to want to get rare earth foams eventually. So unless we really needed baryonic shielding, we'd probably want to get rare earth foams first to make baryonic shielding less expensive. Uh, anyway, there are a few other symbols you might see here. Specifically, this symbol is our faction symbol, the Imperials. And that means that this tech is unique to the Imperial faction. For example, they get this uh, carrier class, Zelvis class, uh, hull design. That is unique to them. Other factions get their own version of the carrier class here. Um, and if we look around, we can see, oh, hey, here's some other unique things for our empire compared to other empires. Uh, so that's kind of cool. Lastly, you might see this symbol. That means these are exclusive. You can choose one or the other here. And we'll look at those when we need to, but that's fairly straightforward. So, that having been said, we now need to pick a new technology. Hmm, let's look at our board situation. 
we don't have to worry too much about unlocking the ability to colonize other planets in our home system because we do have this Boreal planet, which is colonizable from the beginning of the game by pretty much every faction. Everybody can do Terran and Boreal and Ocean, I think? There's like three that you can do from the beginning. So I don't think we need to worry too much about finding out how to colonize things. Now, we do know that this is the only other system we've found so far, and it's got lava and arid, and it's not a fantastic system. The two small planets. And... It's not going to be in contention by anybody else. It's like nobody else can reach this planet, so let's not worry about that right now. What could we worry about? What are we going to need to build? Well, we're going to need to explore a lot more around us. We can't explore any of this area around us because uh, we don't have any hyperlanes there. No, no, sorry, jump lanes. But there is a way to get around the galaxy uh, without using jump lanes. And that is called warp drive. It allows you to move freely without using those jump lanes. It's a lot slower than the jump lanes, but it does allow you to move freely. In addition, this would also allow us to research higher level, uh, deeper, darker secrets of the universe uh, than we can right now, which is certainly a possibility. And what else do we get? Savannah. So these are two strong possibilities. But... Another one I like to grab is this machine bacteria, which gives us an upgrade to our probe abilities, except that we can't get that if we have no strategic resources. So how about we do that? This particular one lets us utilize Hyperium. This one lets us utilize Titanium, but we already have that. And in order to get either of those, I need to colonize this planet. So I do want to start producing those resources. So rather than waiting until we filled up this planet, I'm just going to add that to the docket. It's going to take a... So what are we going to do with this uh, settler here? Well, uh, there's nothing back here for them to settle, so let's send them down this way as well. And we found a system with a colonizable planet. Let's check, out, check it out and see what it is. An ash planet. A huge ash planet. This is going to be a very good one for production, I, I can tell. An arid planet, also good for production. And a tundra planet, which we just unlocked the ability to colonize. So let's take a closer look at these. That uh, colonizable planet there. This small tundra planet. It's not going to give us a lot. It'll, it can only mix, fit a maximum of six population. And unfortunately, ooh, it has high gravity on a small planet. That's, that's not great. Um which is minus the science, happiness, and production. That's okay, though, because we really only need this planet to provide us with food, because these planets are going to provide us with lots of production. Let's do a quick check of that. Ah, another luxury resource. Uh, so you can see that we've revealed the fact that this planet has Eden Incense, and we've also gained five Eden Incense as part of that expedition. You can see there's also another white luxury resource here. White resources are always shown up. Uh, luxury resources are always shown as white, I should say. The uh, strategic resources all have their own color. So this one makes the planet gain extra dust and food, and this one makes the planet grow extra uh, science and uh, partially offsets for the fact that uh, it's a high-gravity planet. So I think this is definitely worth colonizing, and then we need to figure out how to colonize uh, the ash planets and the arid planets in our technology soon. Um, we can see that this is in a mixed anomaly. It's not green, but it's not red either. It gives us extra food, but less happiness. Wow, people here are going to be really unhappy with all these meteor strikes and permanent monsoons. Okay, uh, but this has the platform of wise. The world was once the shipyard in the uh, of the concrete envict. So when you search down here, it'll allow you to search for the title or the thing underneath it. If we search for colonization, it'll show up every colonization tech in the game. And you can see everything with one of these little flags is now blinking at us. Related building in it. So you see here it's things that will help them when they are governing a system or leading a fleet. And in general, you might have one hero that sits on your core world or your best trading world, and prov provides a ton of bonuses, and never leads a fleet. On the other hand, you might have a hero that is permanently assigned to your main fleet, and then a lot of other heroes that will be governors unless you're at war, and then you're going to need them for your fleets. So, 
with my first hero, I usually start them as a governor, and I look for bonuses that they can help with the governor. Hey, plus one influence per person on planets. That's going to synergize really well with my particular racial bonuses, which makes sense because this bottom corner is my racial-based thing. Because that hero is from this faction, they always get these choices. Because the hero uh, is a hero, they get access to all these. All heroes have this one branch at the top that looks the same. All of the United Empire faction heroes have this branch that looks the same over here. And because this guy is one of the four types called a counselor, this is the counselor-specific skills over here. So that's what determines what things are available to you. All right, so I applied that. So he's now providing us plus one influence per person and plus 5% on the system. And if we want to throw him on a ship, he'll provide a little bit of bonus from this thing over here. All right, that's great. So what do we do with this ship? I'm going to leave it here for one turn and see if we can grain some of those probes back. And we discovered another new luxury resource, Red Sang. Although we discovered that last turn. Here we go. We can now colonize that, uh, what was it, a tundra world. And you can do it either by clicking this button, which will just zoom you in, or you click right here. You can rename heroes, yes. It'll help you keep track of which ones, like you might rename them Sis Dash. <laughs> or something to that effect. So here's our uh, colony ship coming down on this tundra world, and you can see there's these weird uh, uh, dudes here. Now we got the high gravity here, so people aren't super happy, but it's offset at least in part, apparently. Um, oh, it's not actually a, a system yet. Right now it's an outpost. How do these outposts grow, you might ask? Well, they need 300 food to turn into a proper system. This represents your population getting bigger, essentially. Now, because this is a tundra world that produces, uh, what did we say? It's 12, it's seven food plus, again, remember, uh, you have a building that's helping with some of this food. Um, what you have here is 25 turns at 12 per turn. Now we could double that to make it 24 per turn coming from the planet itself. It doubles this number up here if you pay this plus 100% food on system. But there are colonists being shipped over here from our capital. And so you can see that while we need 300, and if we discount the fact that those colonists are arriving, it'll take 25 turns, we can see that in two turns, 33 food is gonna be sent on a ship to this outpost. A ship, by the way, that could be intercepted by either enemies or pirates and destroyed before it gets here. It's actually physically represented on the map. And if our ship, if our colony, if our outpost here is really far away from the closest colony we want to send people from, then there's only a maximum number of three of those ships out at any given time, and they move fairly slow. Now, this is directly connected to our capital. We probably won't have to worry too much about this. So... We could also, in addition to doubling the 12 that's being sent here, we could double the amount sent from our capital every every couple of turns. And we could change if we had other systems. If we had a system besides our capital that produces an absolute ton of food and was nearby to this outpost, we could say, actually, I want this system to provide the new colonists because it's closer, because it provides more, etc., etc. Right now, I'm not going to utilize any of my uh, money or influence. I think I have other uses for those, and it's going to be a lot less than 25 turns if you take into account for the fact that they're getting 33 every three turns. And I need to save up a certain amount of money. Maybe we'll come back here. You know what? Maybe we'll double the influence, so we'll send 66 food each turn. There we go. Now, there is one small problem with that. This main system here is now minus 66 food. It doesn't just come from nowhere, it comes from here. And now, in seven turns, we'll actually lose a population point here because it's all be sent being sent over to that new place. Which suggests that maybe we want to focus a little bit on food-related technologies. Wouldn't be a bad idea. Uh, epigenetic crop seeding is plus four per person. 
Intensive cultivation is plus 10 per luxury deposit, which could be very valuable in that new system, but not in our old system. This one just gives plus 10 per planet. Um, so the top one there, intensive cultivation, is one that I will often put on my capital so that my capital can continue to expand and supply uh, food to all these things. So we'll add that to our tree and move forward. Stellaris is a different beast, and I like them both for different reasons. Um, it's I, I don't know if I would say one over the other right now. They're definitely very different games. This is a lot more like a traditional 4X space game, in a sense. And it's got a lot more heart, a lot more direct narrative. Whereas Stellaris is so open-ended and has a lot more interesting interactions with regards to like the Paradox-style gameplay. So they're, they're kind of two different sides of the same coin. Um, if you had to choose one, I would say if you've enjoyed other Paradox titles, and you know you like that, Solaris might certainly be down your, your alley. Uh, now somebody else already found those 10 curiosities. That is crazy. It's, it's turn 11. How many... Oh, there are some factions that start with heroes that give boosts to the number of probes you get, and they could have built a scout or two and, and done that fairly quickly. Or the AI cheats. You know, one or the other. So... I would say if you if you like com more complexity, Stellaris can add a lot of interesting complexity, especially in diplomacy. Stellaris is a lot has also been referred to as uh, Space Europa Universalis because the diplomatic systems are similar. Um, I would say the shipbuilding in this one and the um, the exploration are a little bit yeah you know what they both have that kind of quest system. Again, it's real hard. It's, it's hard to say one of the... I say put them both on your wish list and wait for them to go on sale. Buy whichever one goes on sale first. They're both good. Uh, Stellaris might be a little more polished at this point because it came out um, last... Um, a year ago, May, and they've been patching it significantly since then. So yeah, if I was to say one, I'd say get Stellaris first and come back to this after another few patches because this just came out in June. Uh, so it's more than a year newer than Stellaris and could still use some patching, but Amplitude's always been pretty good about that. So, we've got our... It says we have the ability... Ah, there we go. That's for some reason, I didn't see this button before. So we have a Signal Curiosity, very likely to be an anomaly on this huge ash planet. Hopefully it's a good one, because we got two semi-negative ones there. <gasps> Exiles! So they are added to our population somewhere, I think, is what that means. Uh, maybe not. Maybe that means when you go to that planet, you'll get them? Huh. Or maybe they'll be added on the turn. I'm not exactly sure what that one did, but let's move on. Um, so, I increased that now. What we can see here is because I revealed a curiosity in this minor faction's system, they, in turn, are boosting relations with me because I did a nice thing for them. Now, if we praise them by spending influence, if we send some people to provide platitudes and discuss about how great they are, you can see there's now 10 turns of praise. And it's going to be, I think, at uh, 2... Plus two per turn is what this praise is providing us. If we were to hit praise again, it resets the timer to 10 and increases this number by two. So the most efficient way to woo a civilization to your side is praise them once, then come back nine turns later, just before this expires, praise them again to reset it to 10, except now instead of plus two per turn, it's plus four. And then the next time you do it, it's plus six. If you ever let it run out, then the next time you praise them, it will come back and start at one again. Or sorry, start at two again at the bottom. So you want to, before this timer runs out, if you're planning to get them. If you just keep clicking praise a bunch, then it'll do be the fastest but the least efficient from an influence perspective. <laughs> and again, we're at the very edge of the galaxy here. But I still want to explore what's going on in here. So I'm going to wait a couple of turns until this fleet gets its probe back, which is one more turn. And you can see here's a little food truck. 
Oh no, that's the, oh, hey, there's the guys. That's the population point I just found down here is racing back to other scout to go, because remember those curiosities that we're exploring, sometimes they give you brand new technology, sometimes they give you battle tactics you've never seen before, sometimes they give you uh, luxury resources, and knowing where those are can be very valuable. <laughs> and it would only take one turn to build a scout. It would take three turns to build infinite supermarkets, and it would make them produce more food. Let's put infinite supermarkets on there, get high approval ratings. Cerebral reality is only two turns. And then we'll come back and we'll look at this more. There's some production here. Um, this production actually will make production on this planet go up by four per person. That's really valuable on this system because of this very large boreal planet that has a problem with production because it's a boreal planet. Uh, uh, we now are gaining three Hyperium, or production per turn is one, sorry, and th uh, three Hyperium per turn and plus one per turn four. We can explore. There's no backyard, right? And maybe up in this direction in case there's something hiding over here. Then we're going to send that scout off uh, uh, down here. He'll have his probes left by that time. And we found a neutron star up there. Hey, that's pretty cool. Now we know that if we can uh, get our influence to expand fast enough, we'll gain an extra influence and science in our home system here. Here's the other thing. We can now travel to this star if we get the warp drives. Remember we were looking over here and there's a warp drive? Let's you free move through the galaxy? It still won't let me like click somewhere out here where there's no planets and just go there but it will let you move to a planet which you don't have connected via one of these jump lanes. So that's how we can get access to these. That's why I sent exploration things, because this could have been a really nice system with good planets worthy of colonization. It wasn't, but it could have been. All right, we found another piece of this arm that just refuses to connect to the center because that's the way the galaxy's been set up. Uh, Nakos, a medium ash planet with a bunch of curiosities on it, uh, so let's start looking at those, because maybe they'll make this an awesome planet. Uh, we came up ways with some loot, but that's it. Oh, an event has been triggered. The atmosphere of this planet has a strange psychotropic effect. When inhaled, the sweet vapor seems to allow the subjects to see exactly four <laughs> seconds into the future. Perhaps a concentrated dose might allow even more. Our uh, plus two vision range on fleet on this particular scout ship. That's kind of cool. And meanwhile, he doesn't have any more probes, so uh, he can't do anything else there. So we're going to leave him there. Any other questions while I'm going here? Because I, I, uh, I'm happy to move on to the next set of topics. We covered uh, science, and we've covered exploration and movement here a little bit. We've covered growing colonies. We've covered minor factions a little bit. Uh, Do we have new curiosity? Nope, we don't have a probe yet. Uh, let's take a quick look at our outpost. It now says it's 20 turns away, but there's still food on the way being delivered. Let's check our progress on these guys. Six more turns. We're just going to hit end turn again. Ah! There's a cooperative quest that has just started. Rumors of an academy. This is one I believe starts in every game. We have to explore five atmospheric curiosities in order to succeed and come in first place in this quest. A lot of the quests are like this. Do this before somebody else. So the academy is where all the great heroes are trained. And when somebody finds it, you can start getting more heroes than just your starter hero. But this is going to be part of the way to finding it, is exploring these atmospheric uh, things. Now we lost... Oh no! We lost our custom Zizvali guys that we found, the Exiles, uh, because, remember, we're shipping off a ton of food to that other empire, and those were the newest ones, so they were the first to go. They were the smallest population. I feel bad now. They just got here, and they're already shipped off to that new population. I wonder if that means that when this grows, it will have their population point. I guess we can only wait and see. Aha! Here's a new topic. Politics! 
here is one of the really interesting diverges, divergent uh, places that the game diverges from Endless Space 1. We're going to get into that next turn, I believe. It's telling us right now the industrialists have a huge lead in popularity right now as far as political party is concerned. Uh, and the pacifists and ecologists are next with the scientists trailing uh, and then the... the I can't even see it here. Uh, uh, can I... Does it let me? No, there's like the religious faction is not even represented at all. And as soon as that election triggers, we'll talk all about how it works. Hey, we finished our miniature quest here. A Hidden Rebellion Part 1 has been completed. What happened? Uh, well, dust buys armies, fleets, and gets your tongues waggling. We bribed some of the rebels, and it fell easily. We named it Traitor's Reach as a warning to others. The biggest shock was at the identity of the rebel leader. My very sister, Lena, was leading the rebels. She wasn't... Oh, I'm sorry. Your sister, Lena, wasn't blessed with only one child. Victoria, she had another, an identical twin, Julinka. So my niece was running this rebel base. And now we have to deal with this rebellion further. Uh, now Julinka, the traitor, refuses to speak. She's too young to be the true mastermind behind this rebellion. But that individual identity is there, is, uh, is no clue. You will not sanction any violence against your sister's blood, so she's languishing in solitary confinement, blah, blah, blah. But you need to figure out who is going to uh, be your legacy, right? Who is who's your, going to be your heir? You're getting older, blah, blah, blah. And if you have an heir, it'll stabilize the empire. No more rebellions is what was going on here. We can choose Hadri, uh, our son who's focused on military. We can choose Lena, our sister, who is all about the industry and production and would be more like a wonder-based victory. Or we can choose Petra, uh, which is all about science. And we'll get her hero uh, if we finish that. We'll get Lena as a hero if we finish that. And they are all of their varying types here. Uh, well, let's be a little bit offensive, why don't we? Um, why don't we choose Hadri? We'll get him as our leader. We need a ship with at least 60 offensive military power. That'll help us explore how ship, how the ships work, essentially. We finished infinite supermarkets in our capital. Let's go take a look at how that is interacting with things. So you can see they're still content. Oh, I was hoping that that would get us just above 70%. Um, we'll have to see if we can increase that further. Basically, once you get above 70%, they are happy and they give boosts to the food and influence production in the system. However, if your overall average is over 70%, then your empire everywhere gets dust and science increased. So if you can be happy everywhere, everything gets dust and science, and anywhere that you are happy gets boosts to food and production, or sorry, food and influence. Um, and the higher you go, the closer you get to 100%, the better, basically. There's several steps, several stages. Now, one thing to check is we just gained a new colony somewhere. Where's Trader's Reach? There it is. So it picked a Terran world nearby, and we got a new outpost here. And unfortunately, now it is unable to draw any food from our capital. Because those ships would have no way to get here. So instead, we just have the option of spending 150 dust to boost the food production of this system here, which is important because right now, this system is not producing any dust. It's costing us dust. So now that got boosted to 28 for 10 turns, and it means this will be done much faster. Meanwhile, we found another disconnected world with our probe. It's a good thing we sent the probe out there because this has a bunch of worlds in it. This is going to be a very good system for us. A very productive system with these two planets. Very good production. Very good production. Wow. A bunch of ash planets and hot planets. Then we got a huge hot Jupiter and a monsoon planet, which is going to provide the food for this whole system, apparently. And there are some other anomalies here as well. Extra production here. Extra science and dust here. These are all good anomalies, too. Science and happiness for this fearful symmetry. 
This planet's features exhibit a bilateral symmetry that's unnatural for its mathematical precision. One can only speculate as to what lies underneath the outer layers that cause this. Wow. That's kind of cool. So what we need is the ability to get there and the ability to colonize it. We're getting ash planets right here, right? We know that at least two of these are ash planets and one is a lava planet. We can already colonize the monsoon. So what we need to do is build ourselves another scout and another settler. The scout can go there in order to reveal those curiosities in that system. And the settler can colonize it. And I think we are on the way. This is colonizing ash. And then later we're on the way. No, we have to choose that, don't we? So after that, we're getting food. And then after that, we're going to go to the warp drive so that we can colonize that spot over there. Meanwhile, we got a probe. Let's send it this way. And this scout's going to go this way. So I'm going to leave that scout here. And he is going to continue to probe in these directions while this scout follows the yellow brick road, so to speak. <laughs> you can see here we've got three turns left on this civilization's praise boost. Ah, we found yet another new minor civilization. We are the first to contact these people, apparently. Oops. And we can praise them. They're kind of cool. They're like weird four-armed monk guys. And if we look at them again, they give us happiness, which is great. And remember, we want them to like us because they give us portions of their economy when they do. We get to trade with them, essentially. Long live the United Empire, yes. Cooperative quest complete. <laughs> Somebody else have already explored five atmospheric curiosities. They must have built a lot more scout ships than we have. And this guy level up again. Now, on the off chance we have to fight something early, it might not be a bad idea to improve the damage of our fleet should this guy have to lead it. Or gain a little more influence. Let's get the influence first. The next skill point I will put into his... The next two skill points I'll put into his ship uh, abilities. All right, finished Cerebral Reality, so we're getting some extra dust production over there. We finished the ability to colonize ash planets. That's great. You can see now a bunch of these just turned white because now we can colonize them. This guy uh, has no... Oh, yes, there is something he can... A curiosity he can explore while he's here, which will, again, make the minor civilization like us more for helping to examine their situation. Cyber flora. Cyber flora. A hybrid species that grew from dust-infected lichen. This nearly indestructible plant can be found thriving in even the harshest conditions. Its beautiful glossy sheen and interesting biotechnical properties create both a stunning environment and a source of scientific knowledge. Very cool. Very cool. Plus 25 science just for finding it. And we discovered the planet Bilegi. Bil Bilgeli. A hospitable, if dry planet rich in natural resources, Bilgeli is served as the base for the endless research stations that were built in its orbit. The endless were like the ancient race that was, this Jason Empire that was stretched across the whole galaxy but is now gone, but we find their remnants all over the place. Most games have that kind of a thing. This is what they are. Letum has a fairly large legitimate claim as being the first place in the end endless history where the science virtualization was perfected, blah, 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 for better or worse. This is a fact is given an important role in the mythos of endless civilization. So if we go there, uh, we can see that um, one of these is marked as a unique planet, Anomaly Spatora's Sanctum. Gives This is an anomaly that will not be found anywhere else in the game, is the reason that this is here. Plus three science and plus two dust. Unfortunately, it's a tiny savanna world, so it only fits five people on it. But it's providing a lot of dust science and food, which will feed the people on the other planets, will produce lots of science for us. So, how did we discover that? You discovered the planet Bill Gelly. Did I really?
Oh, there was an event that reveals all the hidden, isolated nodes of this constellation. Even if the map is slightly out of date, the information should prove useful. So that's how we found Bill Gelly. So somehow this is connected to our constellation and it's uh, revealed them. Oh, and Janus was also revealed as part of this constellation, but not really connected to it. That's pretty cool. Let's take a quick look at Janus, which apparently has two currently colonizable planets. Eight, an ash planet. And an ash planet. That's too bad. You usually want to see at least one of the planets being good at food. Otherwise, it takes a long time to get it built up. Um, however, plus three per person thanks to rich soil on this lava planet. Plus three per person due to micro factories. And an extra population slot means that Janus 3 looks like a really great spot to set down uh, a colony. Although it is minus five per person just because it's an ash planet. And people don't like living on ash planets. Janus 4 as an arid planet is slightly less inhospitable and it produces 2 versus 3 versus 3. Hmm. I mean, eh, get some more technology, this is going to be a pretty good system, but right now it's not good for ex early expansion. Hello games and vlogs with Johnny. Yes. I've jumped back into it. I mean, it was out in early access for a while, and it needed a lot of polishing, and then when it actually came out, it still needed some polishing, uh, but it's it's doing well now. So we've got our two colonies that are just sucking all the population from our homeworld here. We're losing another population point in 18 turns because we're down so much food, uh, which is why we're learning planetary landscaping in three turns. We need to figure out how to feed these growing populations faster. New event, Riled Researchers. It appears an intergalactic congress of scientists have turned into a labor dispute. They have come to the conclusion that their work is grossly underappreciated and plan to halt all experimental efforts until their wages improve and their lab equipment is upgraded and their work reported more professionally. So if we ignore this problem and tell the scientists to stuff it, we can focus on production and get more work out of them. But our science production is going to weaken. We've got a decent amount of dust... And we haven't used it for anything yet. There's things to use it for, but just not this. Let's hit minus 20 dust for 15 turns, and we'll get a boost to science. We're coming up on the political ideological angle. Ah, here it is. Speaking of that. So, you can see there are six political parties in the game. The political parties that are supported by the individual pops on your planets are based on the population's race and on the actions that you have performed in the game. Build a ton of military ships, militarists are going to have more influence. If you expand a lot and build a lot of food-based improvements, ecologists are going to have more influence and more votes. If you do a lot of science research and build a lot of science buildings, the scientists are going to have a lot of research. Pacifists are all about dust creation. Religious are everything else. So anyway, we can look at this and try to decide where do we want to throw our weight behind. And industrialists is good for early expansion because it gives us the ability to uh, produce things a little better. We're going to throw our weight behind the ecologists to help with early expansion as well. And if you see we hover over this, we get more ecologists if we build food or happiness generating constructions, if we recruit ecologist heroes, if we assign ecologist heroes to systems or fleets, and if we diversify our population with many different types of unit uh, of people, and constructing civilian vessels like um, uh, settler built settlers, uh, then that also grows ecologists. We can also hover over these other things. Inf influences gives us your religious and religious heroes and other things. Constructing military vessels. Yeah, you can hover over all these. We also have the opportunity to influence this election based on our government type. The republic government type allows you to intimidate citizens or reinforce intimidation. And you can see in the bottom left, it, that tells you why you would do these things, and it costs influence. Other government types might have other benefits, but you won't be able to influence. Like, if you have pure democracy, you can't influence the outcome of the election, but you get more parties in office and access to more laws, which is kind of cool. In this case, I'm going to try to boost the ecologists a little bit, just my official support, uh, which will 
allow us to hopefully get them into second place over the pacifists. Because in a republic, the first and second place parties matter. So we can have our little thing here. We can see in, the, in our only system, El Dorado, there are three industrial votes and one pacifist vote. So it doesn't look like our ecology support was enough. So these are our two political parties. The industrialists are ahead and the pacifists are the second place political party, the opposition, so to speak. So you can also see that being elected has given them experience. That party has gained experience. And that gives you access to more robust, more expensive, more powerful versions of their party's laws. You can see that coming in first place gives you a bigger boost. It makes that party established. Once they get to that little first line here, they become established and then they become entrenched, I think, once they get to the third tier. So what does all this have to do with your play? System colonized. Fantastic. We'll examine that in a moment. We're going to go to the Senate up here, and you can see that the Senate, the party in control, is the industrialist because it's got a little wheel here. You can see the breakdown right now from the previous election. There were four total representatives, one for each of those pops in our home system. And three of them voted industry, and one of them voted pacifists. Now, you can see a little bit more about this if we click on El Dorado. And you can see down here, it shows the political sensitivity of this uh, system. This is based in part to the pops that are in this system. So this will influence the election significantly. What this means is the events and stuff that has been built in this system has been heavily favoring the industrialists and a little bit pacifists and a little bit of ecologists, et cetera, et cetera. And if you click this button, it gives you a breakdown of all the things that have happened recently and how it has affected the pops in this system specifically. So why are 56% of the pops in support of industrialists? Well, there are two different races in this system. One is the Imperials and one is the Hishisho. And the Hishisho, all of these events made them lean a little bit more towards the industrialists. However, because the imperialists are industrialists by nature, you can see their political opinion is industrialist in the bottom left corner. These guys are actually militarists. Because their political opinion is industrialist by nature, every one of these industrial-based events has actually given them strong support. So other races besides the imperials are generally going to have moderate support for these events, but the Imperials, extra support. The Imperial population there, the industrialist governor that we put in charge, the outpost that was created as an industrial uh, thing, uh, industry buildings created uh, has helped in that case, and that effect lasts a certain number of turns, and you can see those listed right there. And the technologies that we've unlocked have also boosted industrialist ideology. There have also been science events that have boosted industrial support in this race specifically. These science events didn't move the Hishisho, Hisho? Hisho? to support the, uh, the industry. They did, however, move both factors towards science. However, this faction, because they're militarists, has very weak support for science. This faction is indifferent to science, so they're moderate support. So this is where you can see all the pacifist events and how they have affected each of the pops in your system. Turns out when you do ecology events within ecology or the militarist faction, they actually are okay. But ecology is directly opposite of industry, so it's weak support for these guys. Here's big militarists and mega. So we can see a little more information about that if we go to the Senate screen here and we click population details. So we look at the Imperials and this shows that militarist support events create militarist support events. Normal. Normal religion to normal religion. Regular uh, ecology goes to weak ecology. Pacifist events to pacifists. Industry gets super strong, and science goes both science and industry. So this population is going to support industry over science. And it's going to support ecology much less likely. So as your population grows and diversifies into different types of pops, you're by, for example, absorbing those minor factions, 
you're going to get a more diverse Senate. If you instead uh, try to limit how diverse your population is, then you can focus on one thing and one thing only, or just a few things. In addition, when populations reach certain numerical values, milestones, they get stronger. Right now, the imperialists on our planets simply produce plus one influence. However, when there are 10 of them, they will have an even greater industrial output than they do right now in terms of political support. When they reach 20 pops in our empire completely, they add an extra 15% influence generation when they have any presence in, in each system that they're in. And when they get to 50, you get another boost. Cool. So the Hishisho, Hisho, they have this effect, they get stronger military, then they get this, then they get this, but you can see that they are different than the Imperials. The Imperials turn science into industry and they hate ecology and they're big on industry. The His Show are militarists first and foremost. They don't like science and they don't like pacifism, but they're okay on everything else. So there you go. That's how the system works in terms of how the types of pops and the things you do influence those votes. When that vote occurs, here's what happens. Two political parties are chosen. If they have a hero assigned to that political party, they can become the representative. So our first hero is an industrialist hero. The industrial party won. And so their industrial guy is here. Now, if we open up our, that hero and take a look, he can actually have some effect when he's leading a political party who is in power. Uh, let's see if we can find it. It's usually towards the outside. Here we go. On Senate, if this guy is a political leader, he provides plus 1% industry per hero level on all systems in your empire. So as long as he is leading the industry faction and the industry faction is uh, one of the parties that's in power right now, and he, let's say he's level 10 and he's got this skill selected, you're going to get 10% boost to industry everywhere in the system. And they're going to have a bunch of these. If I can find another one, here you go. If this guy is in Senate with this power, plus 50 influence per trading company. So if we go back to the, by right-clicking, which is nice, if we go back to this, you see right now he has no skills that are affecting anything, but eventually you're going to have a broad arrangement of heroes and they're all going to have powers that are in, po in, in effect if they, their party's in power. So that's one way that this affects what goes on. Another way is that whichever party won has an automatic law applied that costs no upkeep and gives you nothing but benefits. So you can see here, that automatically, that's what this little uh, pin means, by the way, it's automatically activated when this party's in power. If another party wins, this one is automatically deactivated, you can't get it anymore. So what this means is 10% of industry spent for any constructed is converted to dust at the end, which is great, because we produce stuff all the time. Whoa. We have a massive dust shortfall, and I hadn't noticed it earlier. <laughs> uh, we're gonna have to do something about that in the next 10 turns. Um, well, we can do that right about now, because let's look. There's other laws that we can pass here. You see, we've got certain ones that are available. Certain ones that are independent. Um, and certain ones that are only industry, only pacifists. Or we can see all of them. So, you remember here, dust windfall is the thing that the industrialists have. But if we had the pacifists in charge, we want to look for their uh, special benefit... Uh, it's not listed here, is it? Oh, that's too bad. There are a number of uh, things that you get for um, being in, uh, you know, the, each, each, each faction has its own special thing. But anyway, um, what we can see here is that the industrialists are in power, and we have the opportunity to pass two additional industrial laws in addition to this one. New colony is available because it's available no matter what. You can see required political experience is functional, zero. You don't need anything. The industrialists always have access to this law if you would like. However, if the industrialists stay in power long enough to become established, which they have in this game, then you can get access to this law. 
If they become entrenched, you have access to this law. Each of these, by the way, are more potent and cost more upkeep and you'll get access to them later in the game. Finally, if you get your a given political party is in power for so long, they get all the way to the end of the experience train, you get the most powerful version of their law available. The pacifists, if you recall, uh, did not manage to get more than just uh, a little bit towards the experience established. So we don't get access to Make Love Not War, which is too bad because I love this one. Uh, but we could get Trusted Broker, Let's go back to available and see what's available to us. The Super Tax Act gives us a lot more dust at a cost of a huge penalty. Super tax. That's going to go over real well. The Cram Exam Act is, again, we could trade happiness for science. Uh, we could trade uh, production for happiness. Or uh, these ones, by the way, you'll notice cost no upkeep in the form of influence. However, all of the faction-specific ones do cost upkeep. And I believe all the independent ones uh, that you get later on also cost... No, there's no upkeep for these. They just have a growing... Um, I don't know how the independents gain, gain that. Anyway, New Colony gives us plus 25 happiness for a certain number of turns when acquiring a new colony either by invasion or through, new, through completion of an outpost. I don't know why it says zero turns... Uh, it's supposed to be a certain number of turns. It would cost us one influence per, per person in our entire empire to keep this law in the books. That's pretty expensive, and I don't think I want to pay that. This one is plus one research generation on strategic resource deposits. That's quite powerful. Not right now. It's not worth the two influence per population point. Um, so that those are all good things. I'm not going to pass any laws because I don't need them, and the cost of them is too high for my empire right now. Uh, now, that's pretty much the entire political system. You have an election every 20 turns. And again, the election will be significantly uh, determined by what you choose to build and what you choose to do in your given game. If you're getting attacked, if war is declared on you and you're building up your military, the militarists are coming to, come into power. If you're building your economy because you don't have enough dust generation and you build a bunch of dust, the pacifists are going to come into power. It's a really cool system. Most of the time, the main faction uh, group is going to be in power. You can have an effect on that with the influence or dust that you could throw at the problem uh, that we saw earlier at the very beginning of that political election. Um, you can have an effect there, and that's a, that, I think that's really cool how things change. It, it kind of the way that Oblivion blew my mind when oh you mean I don't choose things that level up that as I fight with my sword I get better with my sword mind blown. It's just it's the same kind of thing applied here. Now um, you can see that we are a federation style government. Um, we get two total political parties. And we get an extra system that we can have before trigger expansion disapproval on the empire. Uh, that is listed here. Normal empires only get six. Once you get beyond six, it starts hitting all of your happiness because your empire is no longer small. It's now so large that people get unhappy. Just because. Um, now, the other types of government are unlocked later. I don't think we can choose them right now. We needed a certain technology in order to switch our government. Um, the Republic is probably closest to Federation. It also has uh, two uh, political parties involved. But instead of gaining an extra system to expand into before we get trigger on happiness, you get the law effects are stronger with a Republic. And it says you here, in a Federation, you can use these actions to try and sway the citizens. You can use influence actions to try to intimidate or change the outcome of an election. In a republic, you can use money. You can bribe. But in a democracy, you get three political parties represented, which means you get extra options in terms of what laws you have, and your three heroes can all provide their bonuses to your entire empire. Holy crap, that's awesome. But, but... You do get more happiness, you do get another law, but you cannot pay to influence the outcome of the election. It's based solely on what your populations are and what you do. A dictatorship can't influence the election, uh, and you get more op opportunities for rebellions, but you set the political party to be represented by one, and it's basically going to be yours 
for all intents and purposes. Um, so you get fewer law slots, and your ruling party just stays in, in power for all intents and purposes. I think I haven't actually used a dictatorship, but it's something like that. Um, so anyway, that's how the politics works. I hope that is not super complicated, um, but I like it. Again, the places you can go to check how to affect these things, population details on this Senate screen gives you uh, in individual looks at your types of popula population in your empire. In addition, if you want to grow a specific race more than others, and you have the appropriate luxury resource at your disposal, you can press this button to favor that population, which boosts its chance of being selected. By default, the largest population in a given system is more likely to grow. But this allows you to increase the likelihood of a smaller one to grow or reduce the chance for the small one to grow even smaller. So in addition to that Senate population button, you can also go to the individual system and click this little detail to see how things are going here and what the actual support in these given areas are. Whew. Politics, man. It's a thing. Okay. So what are we doing now? We're, we're getting some new guys here. We just finished getting our colony on Geysar. That's the first place we ever colonized, so let's go take a quick look at it. You can see it started with one population. It's the imperial population, and I think it always starts with your major empire population. Uh, unfortunately, we lost the, uh, the, the new exile pop in vain. While we're here, we want it to grow fairly quickly, and we can also see that all these other planets that we're gonna potentially grow to are really bad at making food. Like this tundra planet, it's actually really good at making food for a tundra planet for some reason. Uh, and it's partly because, yes, it's actually mostly because uh, there is this red sang here is helping a lot. Because a tundra by default, I don't think uh, gives, oh yeah, okay, planet base output is seven, but it's not because of the, yeah, okay, got it. Uh, so we're gonna get a little more food in production to help us grow the planet and build more buildings. Hmm. What goes after that? More science and dust? We definitely need dust. I have to hit that button because our dust is such a problem. Is there anything we can do in our main capital to help with the dust problem? Nope, this just increases the dust problem by adding upkeep. Everything will increase the dust problem. Uh, when that event wears off, it'll be fine. So what we're gonna need to do is again, you look, hey, economy and trade tab. Hey, yellow things. That sounds good. Accelerated, oh, it allows you to buy out buildings. That's kind of nice. And this allows us access to the marketplace to sell things and make money there. This allows us to build specializations and another building, luxury deposits. Ooh, this would be pretty good for Geysar here because two of these planets have luxury deposits and they would be very good at generating dust with that. Hard to choose, hard to choose. Our home system doesn't have any luxury resources, unfortunately. So we're just going to go with this unique improvement. The intergalactic supermarket. Plus 25 dust per system level. Yep, that's going to be good for us. I'm going to add that to the list. Ah, we just finished planetary landing. <sighs> Despite our dust situation, I think we want to do sustainable agriculture here. Um, or intense cultivation. Yeah, we want to do intensive cultivation because we had that problem where we were trying to grow a couple different places and our capital was actually losing population. Very bad. So that'll take 10 turns to build. Um, and as it builds, we could if it, it, this cost to buy it out with influence will go down. Um, okay. Ah, we missed our opportunity. We forgot to praise them. So now we're back to the low numbers. Uh, I'm going to hit praise again. No, we'll, we'll get them this time. Um, let's pop back here. Two turns left, let's hit again. So it reset it to 10, and now we're getting plus four. And these guys still have seven turns left, so we're gonna leave them be. These guys, we wanted to use the probe and look out there in the world. And we're gonna wait one more time for them and send it down this way. See what's out there. Janus can't be actually looked at yet. All right, so let's move on. 
we were talking about military possibilities, right? We need to get that... We need to build a... A military ship that's capable of fighting. So we're going to do that. We're going to tack on some research here. We don't have anything except a scout at the very beginning of the game, so we're going to get efficient shielding, which unlocks a protector, a defensive support type ship, and attacker, which is a small... You can think of it like a destroyer, for all intents and purposes. It's not a big ship, but it's designed to fight. Diplomatic relation changed. Amicable with them. So now... They were giving us even more dust, manpower, and science. That's helping us out a little bit here. Once we get these guys on board, then that'll help out there too. I am now the sovereign of the pilgrims on Ying. The sovereign is an ally to them and gains access to a special action. That's this action down here. Trigger the migration of a unit of population from the minor civilization system to the closest system you own. If we had this uh, luxury source, I think it's Jandix or something, then we would be able to trigger that because we are the sovereign. Special power because we're their ally. It's cool. We did just unlock a technology that I forgot to look at. I believe I forgot what it was. Ah! Was it this one? No, we already did that one earlier. We did that one earlier. Well, crap. I think it was this one. Nope, we did Tundra earlier, too. Mediterranean. It was this one. We're on Baryonic Shielding now. We did Mediterranean, which will give us uh, the access to get the Warp Drive. Good deal. All right, diplomatic relation changed because they like us now. New event, an unexpected guest. Out of the blue, literally, a new minor faction has abruptly moved into one of your planets and have no intentions of leaving. Whether they are friendly or not is yet to be discovered, but hopefully their intrusion won't be long. Huh. It's up to you to decide how best to treat them. Integration or exclusion, diversity or purity, the choice for the moment has been forced upon you. So two Calgaroos on this system. Uh-oh. Uh, let's take a look at what's going on here. We've run into Reavers! Uh, that's basically just pirates. These are not any other of the major factions. Uh, now, our patrol ship doesn't have a lot of weapons to speak of. It has, like, one turret on the thing. It has no defenses. So, I'm not certain that we should fight this. Instead, I'm going to retreat, which costs us about 60% of our health. Or, yeah, 60% or so. And it goes a random direction. So that's another good reason to be going down the military track, which we are doing right now. We're doing efficient shielding. And then we're going to get N-Wave Fusion, and we're going to look into one of these technologies. Uh, this one... Or this one here are things that we can do with titanium. Uh, neither of those are particularly valuable. This one increases the number of command points that we can have in a given system. But what I'm looking for is modules that we can put on our ships. This one is all projectile based. Focused plasma. We get a projectile weapon, kinetic weapon. We get projectile defense shielding, and we get a kinetic enhancer. So the other opportunity is an energy-based weapon, an energy-based defense, and an energy-based enhancer. Might want to get a mix of both at some point in the future, but right now we're going to have to choose one or the other. Chat room, it's up to you. Energy or kinetic, what's your favorite thing? You like mass drivers or big beam weapons? All right, we just got baryonic shielding, which gives us the warp drive. It gives us the ability to colonize Savannah, and we have advanced scanners that can now do more of those awesome anomalies. And we just completed that patrol and settler grouping here. Uh, let's actually send the patrol separate because they have more move speed. So we're going to send them to Essa. And you can see they're now able and allowed to go straight towards the target. They don't have to follow these paths. It is much slower than following, like if there was a, a path, a white a jump path from here to here, it would be faster than warping to go down one jump path than the other. 
All right. So we got this random event. Uh, the event ended for the scout. Anyway, we need to look at our planet here because we had two of those population goes Calgaros hop onto our main planet. It looks like they're making everybody happy. That's awesome. I don't have a problem with that. They are religious. They're going to bump up the religious likelihood in the future. But uh, who cares? They're going to make everybody happy. That's good. Plus, a lot of extra population gives us a lot of extra food and production and everything. Also, still not getting any of those uh, ships sending extra help here, even though we've unlocked warp. We might wait a turn and see that happen. New luxury resource di uh, discovered, uh, and I think that's because we met a faction that likes that resource. We didn't physically discover it. We haven't gone anywhere. I don't think it's on these planets. We would have seen it. So the only reason we know about that resource is that we met this faction that has that as a preferred resource. Which you can see preferred luxury down there. They've joined our system, so they, they tell us more about it. Uh, okay, seven turns more on these guys. Let's check these guys. Seven turns more. Five turns, four turns. Wait, one more turn, and then we're going to go take care of that problem. I'm going to boost these guys. I'm going to assimilate a lot of factions here as much as I can. The Vordiani and our church acknowledge you. Well, I'm glad that you acknowledge me. We met them briefly here, apparently. That's one of the other AI empires. Getting close to discussing diplomacy. Endless Legend was arguably better than its Civ equivalent. What are the pluses and minuses? I assume you're talking about the pluses and minuses of this game. I am not a developer, no. Um, I am just a fan, so to speak. Gotta figure out where to send this guy. I think he's gonna, again, look in the center for possible worlds. Oh, and... That was the guy that just met us and then briefly ran away. So we're going to head down this direction exploring. Um, pluses and minuses of the weapons. Ah, well, um, if we look at this weapon, it is most effective at medium and long ranges. So that's the laser weapon, whereas the kinetics are better at short range attacks. And if we follow that trend, we can see that these projectile based missile weapons are much more effective at long range and not effective at all at short range. Uh, these ones... Oh, this beam weapon is optimal at short range. So it's not just... No, yeah, energy is optimal at shorter ranges than projectile. It appears to be a trend. Nope, because here's kinetic. So it's it's not the same across every piece of uh, of weaponry. I can tell you that, in general, uh, the different weapon types are going to have different uh, strategic resources. So you can see here uh, that we have access to these kinetic laser, or uh, let's see, kinetic things right here, right? Basic ultra-dense slugs. They do nine damage per second, and they have six anti-missile efficiency. On the next step up, we get 19 damage per second, double the mission efficiency. However, this type of kinetic weapon requires two titanium. The energy equivalent requires Hyperium. And then as we go further up the track, it turns out that this requires Adamantium, and this one requires some other. So part of what's going to determine what you pick may be what kind of access do you have to the different strategic resources. You can see you also get shields that come in the different varieties. This is an energy defense shield, and it requires antimatter. This is a projectile defense shield, and it requires adamantium. But on the other side, don't worry, there are still base versions of these that you can get access to. So this is, you know, 4,368 versus, what did we just look at for the shields? That would be this one, 5400-110. So the strategic versions are roughly 15 to 20% stronger in general, but they cost strategic resources. 
and it looks like they also cost less production. That's interesting. So even if you don't have access to a given strategic resource, you can buy it off the market or you can fashion in. So what you might think about doing is you might consider, hey, I'm going to build my weapons out of titanium and my shields out of this other strategic resource that I have access to. Certainly a consideration to be made. Um, so each of the weapons has a different plus and minus in this case. Like I said, you have to look at the ranges, which can matter. You don't want to put like short and long range on the same ship type because the ship is going to either go in short or long range when you fight, which we will hopefully get to very soon. All right, we know the pirates are coming for Gizar, so we need to continue running away from them with this scout because that scout is not going to be able to fight them. Population gained on Gizar. <laughs> Just in time to get uh, attacked by the pirates. Fantastic. Well, uh, we're trying. We're trying. We're getting there. Um, where is it? Uh, we, are, we are finishing up the dust conundrum because we can't build more ships if we have no dust to support them. Oh, Monkman. They are now cordial with us. Why, thank you. And they have nine turns left. These guys have five turns left. Um, let's praise them again. We got extra. Yeah. Yeah, we can, we can boost this a little faster. Four. All right. What did we find down here when we sent our scout? Oh, we didn't send our scout yet. Go, scout! Ooh. That is one of those planetless systems. A black hole, in fact. Plus 50 science on the system if you can get your influence circle to surround it. Let's keep looking. Oh, boy. So here's one set of pirates. Here's another set of pirates. Another reason that you want to maybe uh, get these minor factions on your side is that pirates will spawn in their systems as long as they are uh, not assimilated to somebody. And I think even if they are your sovereign, you still might see pirates. Oh, you might not. You might not. Anyway, that remains to be seen. But you know you have to deal with pirates eventually. Aha! We have unlocked a new technology stage, which allows us to do system development, which we are going to look at right now. Do we have access? Yes, we do, to at least two different uh, luxury resources. And we can get access to more if we knew how to land and colonize arid planets. We've unlocked an intergalactic supermarket and an accelerated production schedule. So we can now buy out constructions, even if they are not yet complete. So we could complete this, instead of spending the four turns, we could complete it by spending 858 influence or 1.8 thousand dust. Eh, it's not worth it yet. Okay. Our dust situation is mostly stabilized. We were at minus 50 before, if you recall. Now let's see what there is to see over here. Oh, this is another long jump path. And we've got our scout here in the capital, so we might as well use it to explore this new curiosity. We explored all the curiosities available to us before, but we leveled up our science and exploration tech to the next stage, and so now we're able to look at this. Improved ion torpedo module. Now that's damn cool, because that may in fact be better than anything else that we currently have access to. Unfortunately, we... It requires titanium, which is the slowest producing strategic resource we have access to right now. All the more reason to get these guys on board, because they have access to more titanium. An atoll planet. Chains and islands, it's fertile. Produces a lot of food. Good deal. We need to get that faction on our side. Okay. So now we're getting a new type of ship. And we're going to outfit it with our basic weapons, plus that new one that we just discovered. What is the most, what's the most valuable resource at this point? Um, well, you uncover a 
access to those strategic resources in layers. So we right now, I don't think we can see Adamantian right now. I'm pretty sure we have to get to this tier four in order to even see it, but we definitely can't harvest it until we get this technology. And the final tier technologies for the last two are way over here. Um, so we currently have access to the first two and we can see them anywhere they are on any planets. All right, so efficient shielding, once that's done, we'll be able to start building some cool ships. So there we go. We can see we've unlocked the attacker and the Uranef class protector. Population gain on El Dorado. Hmm, market changes. Okay, now we have two new ship designs. So you can see they all have their little symbol here. The role of the attack ship is to inflict massive damage on sh at short and middle range on the enemy. Primary targets are protector and coordinator ships. Secondary targets are carrier ships. This ship is, its job is to protect and assist other ships in battle. Its primary target is attacker and hunter ships, and its secondary target is protector and coordinator ships. So they've got a whole little thing going here. So let's take a look at this Corvette 2. Um, I wish I could rename it when I edit it, but I can't really. It's just gonna be called Corvette every time. So these have a number of slots. Let's first take a look at the offensive slots. You can see that we've got an offensive slot here, only offensive things can go in, another one here, and then an offensive or a defensive slot here. We have a choice. Finally, uh, we have a defensive slot here and a support slot here. So let's look exclusively at the offensive slots. Well, this is 25 damage per second. Nothing else we have comes close to that. Except the basic plasma beam, huh? Oh, short range. Hard to get that into use. Um, and it will take longer, like, you won't be able to do much with it until you get into short range. So, why don't we... These are long and medium. They're projectiles. If we go up against somebody that has good projectile defense, we might be screwed. So let's put lasers that have decent chance at hitting at long range on the ship as well. Now, these aren't good lasers, but it's possible that this will help us more than if the ship that we're going up against has a bunch of projectile defense. Okay. Now we get to put one type of defense on this ship. I think pirates use projectiles. So I'm going to put projectile defense on this ship. It also increases the health of the ship by 40. Alternatively, we could get plasma shielding, which gives us extra shields of 120 and shield defense of 12 and a small health bonus. But we're going to stick with, with the projectile defense for now. Then we can... Uh, now, <laughs> this ship is really slow. If we don't use the only... Excuse me, support slot to increase its move speed, it's going to take forever to get anywhere. So that's not really a choice right now. Good news, though. I'm going to apply this design. You can see effectiveness is given to you here. It also tells you how much damage you're doing that's projectile versus energy and how much defense you have that's projectile versus energy. If you want to get detailed stats, it'll even show you that. The type of uh, missiles versus kinetic non-missiles that can't get shot down. It shows you the actual pl bonus to health and the, you know, hull plating absorption from blah, blah, blah. You can get cool stuff. All right. So we boosted our, cor our, escort, our Corvette there. Oops, I don't want to create. I wanted to just edit this guy. So, there are certain modules that we see here now that we didn't see before. This debris analyzer can only be installed on support ships, protective ships. It could not be installed on another ship. There's probably also modules that we can't see now that we could see before because they can only be installed on attacking ships. So, Let's see. Um, I think we still... This is just too big a boost not to add those extra... Extra shots for long... We're just going to keep everything at long range right now. We'll come back and make some changes to this later. If we need to. Um, and then... 
We have no other no other military slots to fill. So now we've got two defensive slots. Let's put one of each so we get a little bit of shielding. We get a little bit of uh, projectile defense as well. And then we get our two slots, which could either be used as defense or as um, this slot is only uh, that, which again, we have to use some kind of movement thing there. Meanwhile, we can either have this be more of a tank and it repairs the ship after battle, or we get some science for every command point we destroy. Well, we're going to go hunt some pirates. I think we want some science as a result of that. So we're going to apply that design. And now, uh, let's let's build some of those guys. Uh, what is our maximum number of command points? We start with four, and I think that is still the case. Yep, four is the maximum command points we can have. Command points are the maximum things you have in the fleet and the size of the ship as well. So our small ships are one command point, our medium ships are three, and I think the large ships are five. And if we go over here, we can see um, we unlocked the small ships here, uh, and then we have the three-point medium ships here, and then the large uh, carriers are here. They cost six, actually. I thought there was battleships or something bigger, but I guess they kind of stop at cruisers and they go straight to carriers, which is interesting. You have the coordinator and the hunter, respectively, here. Now, also, you'll notice there are these cool enhanced versions of those hulls. Basically, each of these options unlocks extra module slots on the hull. But if you put anything in those slots, it costs extra strategic resources to build that ship. So both of these are pretty cool to have. It also increases the manpower that can fit on these ships. We're going to get to those later. I think we want to get some more options of... Um, that we can actually use on our ship itself before we use the more, more modules. We finally made it to Essa. We're going to start our colonization effort. So let us settle the world that provides the most possible food. No, oh, it's not going to show it to us yet, so we have to hover over these. Uh, where's our food? Oh, it's definitely going to be the monsoon planet, isn't it? Because all the others are no food. So yeah. Here's the thing where the devs heard Monsoon and they thought, oh, tons of rainstorms. Monsoon actually has to do with a wind pattern. And in Southeast Asia, that Monsoon brings lots and lots of rain. But that's not always the case. Fun fact. Thank you, Demetrios. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them for you. Okay, so we're at this situation again. The problem is... Oh, actually, yes. Because we have warp drives, our... Ships can now come from the homeworld and send food slash colonists, so we can grow this a lot faster. We can pay to increase this from 11 to 22. There's some money to make this grow. And unfortunately, holy crap, minus 26 because it's uh, an outpost, which is minus 10. You know, I don't know, that seems like it's double, doesn't it? Minus 26 is actually... Hmm. I'm not sure where it's getting minus 26. That's a conundrum for me. But uh, we're definitely going to want to turn this into a proper colony as soon as possible. So we're also going to increase the food coming from our capital. Hmm. Do we want to do that? Is that going to hurt our capital? Right now, it's already weakening our capital, but we're about to finish intensive cultivation. I'm going to save my influence for the moment and just rely on the capital sending its normal food, which is going to be boosted as soon as this finishes, because the food that it sends out is a percentage of its total production. In this case, it's producing what looks like 120, and it's sending 70 of that. So roughly, it's 120-something. Yeah, so it's probably about half-ish of the food that's being produced. Uh, from the capital. Hmm. Okay. So anyway, the other thing that we can do here is look at those anomalies. Uh, so we definitely want to... Oh, we just zoom in in order to do that. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's, let's... Hopefully, these are good anomalies that we're about to find. Ha! Ah, we found Red Sang. That is going to give us extra food and dust. And we found Titanium Underground. Excellent! So that is going to help us quite a lot. 
You can now see that we're actually getting a little more food than we were before. Instead of 22, we're getting 24, thanks to that red sang. So, I think we are also actually an abundant deposit of titanium. That's glorious. We're now getting six titanium a turn and three hyperium. That's a pretty good haul. And we're going to leave our scout here to find all those other curiosities uh, as its probes recharge. Meanwhile, we have this scout, which is just hiding here because we know that somewhere over here there are pirates. Yeah, you think it's tripling that? That outpost number for some reason? That one's a little curious to me. System colonized. Oh, great. Maybe. Hang on. We just finished colonizing this system. I wonder if this will be... No, nope. I was thinking maybe the number of outposts you had had an influence on it. But I guess not. All right, so two more turns here, so let's boost this one more time to make sure it doesn't end prematurely. And these guys have seven more turns and six more turns. We're going to let that go. So Trader's Reach finished. And you can see we are way behind on dust right now, which again is a little confusing. You know what? I think it is that event that's reducing our dust income on everywhere, but it's not being represented here for some reason. Minus 20 from... Oh, it's increasing our upkeep, isn't it? There's an event that we said, increase our upkeep by 20. That's exactly what it's doing. But it's not showing up here as, oh, there's another minus 20 here because of that event. When that event goes away, all the numbers will make sense again. Um, great. So, yeah. You can see our dust is getting very bad now. Uh, so let's see. It'll take five turns versus... Yeah, we're going to build Cerebral Reality right now. Uh, and then hope, <laughs> basically, that uh, our dust recovers in time. Or that event wears off. I think it was only ten turns. Maybe it was fifteen. Alright, we've uh, researched a new technology. This one allows us to add 150 manpower to the defense of our systems as an improvement, as a impervious bunkers. And it allows us to convert population directly into manpower. What does that mean? What is manpower? I'm glad you asked. Glad I asked. We also got the advantage of having plus 200 total manpower capacity on our empire's reserve. So, that's because we unlocked a particular stage. We unlocked stage two by researching one thing in stage one. Uh, so, how does this whole empire manpower thing work? All of your planets are producing a certain amount of food. And if we go back and click on our planet and we hover over the food, you can see that a certain portion of the food, I think it's 10%, is being sent to, is going to be converted to manpower. In fact, we know it's 10% because the colony base automatically makes every colony in your entire empire convert 10% of its food into manpower. Now, this system has a capacity for 240 manpower, which I think is based on the colony base. No, I don't know. It's based on a base number. That can be increased by building things like the impervious bunkers. If we build these, it changes this number from 240 to 3... Uh, what was that? 100 and 150. So it would go from 240 to 390. And then this 11.7 would slowly fill up this until it gets full again. It would be 240 of 390, roughly 60%, and it would slowly fill back up. Right? Right. Okay. I think, hopefully this is how it works. So you have this manpower that's locally located in this system. When somebody comes to invade this system, they will drop an invasion force and it will fight this manpower. This is your garrison. Now, if they blockade it and siege the planet for a while, they can knock out your garrison and then invade later 
when your garrison's been reduced. Your garrison can never recover when it's being blockaded and sieged from above. So, how do you make your systems stronger and more defensive? You increase this number. But, right number we're at 100%, and this 11.7 is still disappearing somewhere. Where is it going? It's going to the Empire's Reserve. This represents your man em Empire's military reserves, which are manpower that isn't currently assigned to either your systems or your fleets. When ships are built or system defenses need replenishment, they are supplied with manpower from these reserves. If we go back and check, take a look at our ships real quick, I believe it shows, maybe not on this screen. Yes, you can see it says an optional cost of 0 to 100 manpower. When you build ships, it takes from your Empire's reserve. If your manpower from your reserve isn't there, the ship will spawn severely undermanned. And if that's the case, it will have severely reduced effectiveness in combat. Here's another thing. When you want to invade a planetary system, the ship's manpower is sent down to the planet to attack. A certain portion of the ship's manpower. Basically, they're marines for all intents and purposes. If that invasion fails because you didn't wipe out enough defenders or they were stronger than you thought, your ship's manpower will not replenish unless you go back and orbit a friendly planet. Or at very least, it will replenish very slowly if you're in enemy territory. But if you send it back over a friendly system, then the ship will slowly recover its manpower until it's back up to 100%. Then you can send it back and siege again and hopefully win that time. And if you noticed, uh, one of the options, I believe, on one of the guns that we could put in there, or one of the tactics, is you could knock out the enemy's... Uh, it's not actually available here, and we'll talk about the tactics when we actually fight the pirates, but uh, one of the things that you can do is try to knock out... When the ship takes damage, it knocks out some of the manpower and makes it less effective. So we can see that... Uh, the base increase of manpower in your system every turn is based on the planets that are producing stuff, so we know what that is. And our star system and fleet consume a fraction of your increased base manpower to replenish their troops. So we know that, uh, you know, somewhere we've got one of our systems is probably filling up with manpower. Maybe it's our brand new system? Trader's Reach? Yes, Trader's Reach is at zero manpower because it's brand new. So it's pulling from the Empire main thing. Now, it's still sending this 4.9 to the Empire Reserve, and then from the Empire Reserve, it's being delegated back down to this planet system. Okay. So that's manpower. But how do these ground battles actually work? We just talked about how you make ships, and ships uh, can have these different things, and they're cool. Well, there's actually a thing that has to do with your manpower as well with regards to ground forces. You start the game only with the ability to have infantry. We managed to go to the stars, but we forgot how tanks work, apparently. Um, so you can see there's some things about, uh, about infantry. They have 50 health, 20 to 40 damage by default, and they have plus 50% effectiveness against air. So they counter air forces. The armor is just really strong. You can see it has 240 health, and it does 40 to 60 damage, and it increases the probability that you're destroying improvements during the ground combat when you're trying to seize the planet. Finally, you have the air type, which has even more health, does way more damage, and has a improvement destruction uh, increase on it as well as a population destruction. So the reason that infantry have that bonus against air is to make it so that you still bring some infantry with you. Because otherwise you're like, why would I not just use armor and air all the time? So let's look at this. Break it down now. Okay. So, at the beginning of the game, you only have infantry. Whenever you go into combat, 100% of your troops will be infantry. They will get these stats. So, um, what that means is, every five manpower is going to be converted into one infantry unit for the purposes of the battle. And if you unlock armor, you can say, well, 70% of my forces are going to be infantry and 30% are going to be armor. The manpower cost is would then be essentially uh, 15 of the infantry are converted into armor. So three times as many manpower is used and converted into armor. However, you'll notice that the damage increases by about 
a hundred fifty percent to one hundred percent. Which means, oh, well, that's not a great deal. But the health increases by more than four times. So that is pretty significant, I would say. Then on top of all that, you can spend resources. Early on, it's going to be the strategic resources that you have easy access to, like uh, Hyperion, uh, what is it? Hy Hyperium and Titanium. Um, and then later on, it's going to be the other types of resources that you have access to to build up armor and to build up air, and you'll unlock these over time. So you're going to choose a specific percentage and say, 30% of my popul my, popul my manpower is going to be converted to infantry, 20% to armor, and then a ton to air. 50% air. I don't know what the best possible outcome is. I assume uh, a two-thirds infantry and then half and half armor and air is probably not a bad thing to do. Because... You get more troops with infantry, but you get more powerful things with armor and air. So I would say, if you have armor and air unlocked, and you've upgraded them a lot, and you're attacking, probably send in the armor and air. Probably good. Anyway, um, we probably don't have to spend resources on this now. It looks like we could afford it. No, we can't. We don't have the Empire Dust to unlock them all at the same time. So, that is how these things break down. And, again, this number is replenishing your systems and ships that have been defeated or just barely brand new. Brand new ships. Okay. So that's manpower. You don't need a degree. All of this is very easily learnable uh, if you just hover over the tooltips. And, and it makes a lot of sense to me anyway. I, I could see how, for some people, if you're not super familiar with A, Am Amplitude Studios games, or B, these kind of games in general, it could be problematic. Oh, there's the pirates. Um, let's run away again with the scout ship. He can't. He can't do much. Um, meanwhile, we're gonna want to build uh, four. Let's build one, two, three corvettes and one escort. Ah, we have to choose a new technology. So where are we now? What do we need to do? <clears throat> hmm. I think we determined that we want to go to Janus. Hmm. We don't really need any new technologies to deal with that. What else we want to do? Nakos, we already have the ability to colonize that if we wanted to. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. A rival has built an outpost here. That's literally our only access to the rest of the galaxy. I think this calls for a military blitz, doesn't it? Yes, I think it does. First, autonomous construction to increase our ship's uh, fleets from four to seven. Next, high energy magnetics uh, increases our damage uh, when defending in a ground battle. So that's another defensive building. We don't worry about that. Electromagnetic shield is another defensive building. What does this do? Increases flotilla crew destruction by 25%. So that increases the crew destruction we inflict on the enemy in space combat. Pretty good. We're also going to get loss of... Ooh! This support module allows us to reduce the enemy manpower when sieging much faster. That's very good. Hmm. We already know we have those missiles, right? They have those titanium missiles that are very good as projectiles. We need some good beam weaponry, don't we? So let's look at this. And that's two technologies, then we'd unlock the next tier, and then we'll look there for other options. Like, uh, booster for projectile damage. Maybe that we'll find that up here somewhere. Either way, that's our, that's our go-to goal now. Conquer Procyon. We'll, we'll have diplomacy with other factions that are worthwhile. We forgot, we have our scout sitting here for a while, he needs to do some more checks of those... I mean, even if you're not planning on colonizing something, these can give you pretty beneficial things. Not least of which because, hey, look, we got some free science. And we found out about an anomaly here, but the free science is nice. You always get some loot. Ooh, we got population that's going to be sent back to our planet again. Hopefully it won't get killed off. So this gives us a new type of population, which is good. Diversity is great, in, you know, except for, you know, kill the alien and the mutant and the heretic um, kind of situations. All right, we said we were going to make this guy a little bit better at fighting the next time he leveled up, just in case we do need a hero. 
And we are now building an army worthy of Mordor. I mean the Empire. We can now check out one more of these situations. We can't colonize gas planets. Ooh. Comatite Volcano. Lots of production there. And 50 free dust. I like it, because we're running out. Um, we're going to need to build those dust-based buildings soon. Although we are gaining we some... Defend the faith, whatever that requires. Whatever it requires, huh? Uh, so when these pop up, these diplomatic messages... The most important thing to note is what it says down in this corner, because these pop up specifically because something changed. Diplomacy in this game is very interesting. You start at Cold War, which is what this symbol represents. If they wander into your territory, you are free to attack them. If you find them in neutral space, you are free to attack them. No guarantees that it won't piss them off. You can't be like, yeah, I know I blew up your ship, but, you know, it's middle space, anything goes. No, they're going to still be mad by that. Um, and you're only able to do simple negotiations. You can go to peace status from Cold War, or you can go to war status from Cold War. It can go either way. The thing you can't do in Cold War is go into their territory and then initiate an attack. You can go into their territory, but they can attack you and you can't attack them. You can't attack their cities and planets uh, without declaring war. You can't attack their fleets inside their home territory without declaring war. And I think what changed here is we've been in Cold War, but what changed is that they're threatening us now. And you can see by their stance, they mean it. You can click this and look a little bit more about the Void... Void Yarion, whatever they are. These guys are shipbound. They live on great arcs. They can move from place to place. They're like the Terran in StarCraft. Hello, Michael. I wave back. I don't have an avatar to do it with. Or a camera. Um... <laughs> I think I need to build the intergalactic supermarket. It's going to take so many turns, though. I kind of want... Ugh. Oh, hey, look. Uh, we can do this. We're going to leave the guys who are good on fertile on fertile. Oh, they're all on fertile. Okay. Anyway. Uh, this way, we're getting a lot more production... No, getting a lot less production. We're getting a lot more happiness. See, now we can see the effect. Plus 10% food and plus 10% influence. Because if we leave these guys, and you can see, if you hover over them, you go back, it drags and selects a certain number. You can put them over here. Um, this reduced the happiness, but they're still happy. Hmm. It's just that it's minus 9 from overpopulation. But both of these are fertile. So let's just put these guys over there and reduce that unhappiness at least a little bit. All right. Hmm. Looks like we're going to get another one of those guys next. That's cool. <sighs> that did lower my production a little bit. Disappointed! So many things you got to do. So in six turns, we'll have our flotilla. Although... In a few more turns after that, no, we actually need a total of seven ships. That's problematic, and I'll show you why. Faction sovereignty, huzzah. Fund the development of this minor civilization system, temporarily increasing its yield and giving you access to its faction trait. Uh... It's VR amateurs, plus five per stage unlocked in science and exploration quadrants on systems. We've unlocked two stages, so we would get plus ten happiness everywhere if we pay that. Hmm. And they would give us more dust. For a little bit of red sang? Yeah. Wow! That's a lot more dust! Holy crap, that solves my whole dust conundrum! I think it's only temporary... Uh, it's still in effect for 10 turns, but wow! Can we use that over here? No, we don't have the right resource. What about here? Don't have the right resource. Don't care! That was amazing! 
And over here, we can ask them what they might want in order to uh, get, uh, get them to assimilate into the Great Empire. For centuries, they've gazed at the heavens and wondered what mysteries lie out there. Search curiosities until they feel content that the mysteries of the galaxy are not all harmful. Yeah, that shouldn't be a problem. We got a couple of probes out there already. This is the ground support module, which is great when you're trying to conquer things. His show has been built. Moving forward. <laughs> Two and a half hours already. Don't worry, guys. It's going to be brief. No, it's going to be a long one. I am very uh, winded. <gasps> We've built a ship with at least 60 military. I forgot that was our goal. It's been sitting in the top right. Hey, by the way, don't forget to do this. It gave us a brand new hero. Hadrai... Lenko, he's a militarist. We already had one, so it doesn't give us a new faction leader for one of the Senate things, but this, because he's a militarist and a guardian, he's probably going to be pretty damn good at fighting. So we're going to put him in charge of our new fleet. The trail runs cold. Jalinka rots in cells, silent. Nobody knows anything about the ancient rebellion, or nothing they're prepared to admit. Blah, 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 blah. So... We have to look to the future, try to put the matter out of your mind, and instead think of the millions of true patriots, but oh no, it's still, you're paranoid. Should you heed the warnings of the warmongers in your ranks, epitomized by the Sheridan name and militarize, or should you hark back to an earlier age of scientific invention? Possess planets of every climate type. Huh. Hold at least three systems of level two or higher, or win five battles. If we win five battles, we get a new laser module. Eh, that's okay. 17 damage per second doesn't seem that much compared to some of the other ones we're about to unlock. United Empire gives a sci-fi design school. Oh, wow. That's just a straight boost to the production of our empire. Who's Yuri? Plus five science per person per planet with anomalies. That's also good. I don't know. Chat, which one? Industry or science? You have 30 seconds. Make your decision. <gasps> this new hero got upgraded to level four automatically for us. That's great. Plus 10% health, plus 20% health on our fleet. Good. Plus 10% shield absorption on fleet. I think that's a good place to start. What is the other option? Ooh. Experience per turn. The ships level up. And the fleet sees farther. I'm going to do one of each. I see two industries. Nobody in the YouTube chat has decided to chime in. Let's see. Ah, guys are. Is gonna have a large population. One of these unique improvements wouldn't go badly here. How is that compared to our capital? This holds a total of six, six, no, six, five. So 11, 17, 22. If I did my math right, this one's definitely not going to have the most, but damn, it still has a lot for a two-planet system. That holds eight. This holds eight. That's 16 versus the 22. And then our... Oh, this is the new one that we're building. Four, nine, 14, 15, 16. The gas giants lower it. So our capital's the only other one that might... Seven plus four is 11 plus 8, 19, plus 5. It's a little bit bigger. But it's busy. It's busy building other things. I think I do want this one to build our... Especially because it's got a lot of luxury resources. Dust is going to be a nice productive thing here. Gulp, 44 turns! Alright, we're just going to back that up a little bit and look to one of these other options to increase things. Um, we don't have any strategic resources here, so this is the best we can do to increase our production at this time. It'll take eight turns, but it'll give us plus ten. 
Ugh. Hmm. I mean, we could colonize this here, too, which gives us more options as far as uh, production is concerned. Let's do that. We'll get to that later. It's good, but it's not its not worth it yet. So, uh, we've gotten plus 500 military uh, manpower capacity in our entire empire. And we have an improved ship design. Army and defense ship improvements. Starting experience for new ships is Rookie 2. Good deal. Be the first to raise one of your heroes to level 9. Huh. I don't know if we're going to be able to do that, but if we do, uh, it's worth 75 adamantium. And we just gained access to new defense modules and lasers. So, the last thing I want to do before we get involved in this war is consider what new lasers... These were medium and long range also. Can we find something that's short range? Yeah. Focused plasma. They're projectiles again, but we're probably going to need it. We'll do this, and then this to give us even bigger fleet possibilities. It also gives us another type of missile weapon, but it's not as good as our current missile weapon, huh? Or we take this to give us better defenses. No, we've already unlocked this second tier. We can look at this. This beam is only damaging at short. Yeah, let's unlock more beam weaponry, especially strong ones that can be built with Hyperion. We have a decent amount of that. So we'll start there. Oh, we gotta choose the objective, that's right. Industry, industry. War requires production. I see a lot of industry suggestions. Okay. Let's talk about how to get your systems to higher levels. Oh, he's left unassigned, is he? Well, let's take it. No, no problem. We're going to do this, and then we're going to click here and assign the new guy. He definitely looks imposing. So he's the leader of that new thing. Now... Our current system is level 1. You can level up your systems when you research along this economy and trade track. Specifically, when we got to the third tier, we gained basic system development, which allows us to unlock the level 2 upgrade. Oops, uh, I hit space by mistake. Well, oh, they like us more. Good. There's... An interesting thing. A distant stellar giant, about 80 times the size of an average star, just gone supernova. And a pacifist group has launched a campaign to bring home the fleets that were monitoring the event rather than leave them on patrol, and it makes everybody happy. Yay! I shall defend the faith, whatever that requires. They're demanding things of me. Alright, well, we're gonna have to do something about that. Okay, so here's level 2, level 3, and level 4. We can go here and create a template which will allow us to level up all of our systems with a given bonus. Level 2, we choose one of these luxury resources. It should probably be one that we produce. Uh, you can see that we're producing four per turn of Red Sang and one per turn of this Eden Incense. Uh, and this particular one will give us food. This one will give us... Uh, influence. Yeah, I guess we will make the upgrade give us plus four food. So, now if we go back to our home world, take a quick look, we have a new system development option. It costs no upkeep, takes one turn, and levels up this system to level two, which means everybody produces more food. I'm going to take a moment and do that to help speed up the expansion. Uh, now, we need something else. Geysar is going to help us by building a settler ship. Oh. It's the one we wanted to build but didn't have the production. You know what? I'm going to spend the influence to build this settlement ship immediately. Boom. One turn.
This guy needs to explore some more, though. Because we need to uh, find more of those uh, curiosities, don't we? And this guy can do it while he's here. There's actually three left in this planet. He's just going to keep sending out expeditions. We got 25 influence from that. Oh, we have another scout ship here. I forgot about him. Well, we've explored this area pretty significantly. <gasps> oh! It looks like one of our probes just barely detected this system with a gas planet. So you know what? We're going to try to go there. Yep, it's going to take forever. We're going to do it. Because it might lead us to more systems here that we can get sort of a hook into the other arm of this spiral galaxy and maybe get some get a, get a foothold over there. Right now, we're pretty stuck here. I don't think there's that many other ships up in this direction. Or not ships, planets in that direction. Thank you, Reborn, for hosting. All right, next turn. So El Dorado is still building up these corvettes. Hyperion Magnetics is going to finally let us build and design a few more ships. Also has its rewards. A new objective, lifting the lamp. Capture, assimilate, or attract a new population type into your empire and get rewarded. Can do. What's the difference between ES2 and Civ 6? I'm not sure that's a good comparison, but if you're just talking overall effects, finally got rid of that minus 20 dust. Ooh, that was killing us. Um, let, me, let me answer one question at a time here. ES2 and Civ 6. Endless Space obviously has a big theme difference. It also has a better narrative. We're getting these quests that pop up that really add to the flavor of the faction you're playing. They, if you read through this flavor text, it's not badly written like you'd expect from most of these games that add quests into the game. It's really quite well written. And Civ doesn't have anything like that. Civ 6 also has oh, just such a bad diplomacy system. I mean, I know what they were trying to go for, but it just doesn't work. It's like, you get empires that just hate you for doing the thing you have to do. Like, oh, I'm getting attacked over here, I better build up my military. And then somebody comes over and says, hey, I don't like that you have a big military, because it says so on my card over here. Like, ugh, that's just... Paradox has been doing diplomacy correctly for so long, you can't just copy them? God. Anyway. So, the diplomacy in this game, which we haven't really looked at. But one of the things I love about it is you start at this cold war. You don't start at peace with people. So you could fight right off the bat and then make peace with them afterwards, potentially, depending on what you, were, uh, what, what, what you can try and threaten them with, if you're stronger than them, what have you. Uh, but there's other cool things that have to do with the diplomacy. This so, is unwelcome. For what reason do you interrupt our crusade? Declaring war costs influence. It's not something you can just do for free. Closing your borders costs influence. It's not just something you can do for free. Um, and that is great. There's a political cost in the form of influence. You want to do other things with it. It, it. it has other uses that you want to do, and you have to use it to do these things. You can also trade, but that costs influence too if you want to do Let's map see. sharing. And hey, I'll give you a dust bribe if you give me your maps. Right? Hey, it looks like they're, they're willing to take that. I don't want to pay 964 for map sharing, but um, oh. let's see if they're just willing to do map for map. I don't think they will be. No, definitely not. So... That cost is cool. And then once you get to peace, then you can potentially get to an alliance. And once you get to, um, you know, peace, you can get trade deals and things like that. And you can trade technologies and all kinds of stuff. But there's another level, level here. There's another layer. This influence pressure at the top, the amount of influence that you are gaining per turn, if it's higher than the other person here, it's going to push this bar 
one way or the other, whoever's highest. So if I'm gaining a lot of influence and they aren't, uh, if I'm getting more than them per turn, it slowly pushes towards them. And when it gets to this step, I can demand things of them. And they either have to declare war on me or give it to me, basically. And that's kind of cool. Um, the AI kind of does feel like another player who's trying to thwart you. They, they kind of did the AI okay in this game. I, I haven't played it a lot. I would say it's slightly better than Civ 6, which unfortunately, that's not saying a lot. The Civ 6 AI is so bad, so very bad. Um, and it still isn't fixed. They're both going to continue working on it. Um, and we haven't gotten to the combat yet, and building your own ships is really cool. And I like a lot of the things they did with the tech tree in Civ 6, and I kind of like how they did the civic system, but man, the whole UI on that could use a big once-over. There probably could use, like, I normally don't see this, but I think the technology tree could probably use a few new technologies in Civ 6. It's very rare that I think you need more of something, but it's just so bare bones. Usually I scoff at the, uh, at the situations, uh oh. Uh, create and merge. There we go. Um, I usually don't, uh, like, scoff at the things that are like, Armand adds 900 new buildings! And it's like, God, you know, that's way too many. You can't possibly expect those to be balanced in any meaningful way. And I don't mean that some faction is going to be stronger than the other because that's only one way of balancing things. Another way is, well, nobody's ever going to build this building because it's not it's not good compared to these other options, so why even put it in the game? You're cluttering up the game state and making it harder for me to play because you thought more is better. More is not always better. Okay. So, we've got a battle. Let's take a look at battles. We know that this pirate has lots of defense against energy weapons, and his weapons are energy weapons. Uh, you can see that by the projectile energy balance in the bottom left corner there. We can also see that he is much preferred to short combat than long. Our ships, on the other hand, have <laughs> very little energy attack, but very high ener uh, projectile attack. So we're both probably going to hurt each other a lot. Not great. Uh, now, because we only have four ships in this fleet, we have to position them in the middle point. And we have a few options. These cards that we can choose have some effects and they determine the range of your three different subfleets when you go into combat. So we definitely want one that's in a long-range category because all of our weapons are much better at long-range than they are at short-range. Um, so power to shields is good, except I don't think any of our ships have shields. So the actual effect of that is not going to be good. Uh, okay, gaining dust for destroying enemy fleets. Probably better. Arguably better. Yeah, revive and rebuild. So let's take a quick look at the advanced tab, which might explain this a little better. You can see that there are different strategies that are used on the politi on the actual battle map here depending upon which card you use and it's based on where the ranges are. So if it's short range and medium range, these two, the top and the middle, try to go straight towards the enemy to close the distance as fast as possible. And the medium one takes its time going out here to get in a good position for medium attack without being at long range either. And this one, you can see this one's trying to be at long range, so it takes a quick turn and doesn't go anywhere close to the enemy if it can avoid it. Um, and then this one also just kind of goes way out here, so it's at long range and this goes to medium range. And then you got two close and a long. Now, you can also see that you can drag these from spot to spot. Unfortunately, um, we only have three CPs worth of four CPs worth of ships here, including the hero. And you can only start using this top section when you have five CPs worth of ships in your fleet. And you can only use this bottom section when you have 10 CPs of ships in your fleet. So right now we're stuck using the middle section, which means we only care about what's going on in the middle. These cards are never all long range or all short range or all medium range. They're all varied. So you're going to need to make some ships that are good at long range and some other ships that are good at medium range so that when you have a big fleet 
And you have to put some in those other areas that, in order to balance it, you put the medium where the medium goes and the long where the long goes, etc., etc. So you build your battle cards and your fleets in tandem to work together. So in this case, we're going to choose Revive and Build. And we can distribute our fleets based on the best range compatibilities that will distribute them amongst the three automatically for us, or we could choose. Toggle the locking state of all your ships. They'll change flotilla if you use the presets, blah, blah, blah. Okay, you can also look at this and say, okay, here's the military situation between the two. Here's the situation of, okay, these guys favor energy. We favor projectiles significantly. And here's how they favor different ranges. So you can use that information while you're going. So we'll head back here. And we're going to watch the battle, because one of the cool things about the Endless Space series is they show you the battle. You get to watch it. You don't have to. You can just snap your fingers and let it go. But when you have really big fights happening, sometimes it's really cool to watch. There's the enemy pirate ship. Here's our three ships plus our hero. And we're going to let loose with a barrage of... Oops. A barrage of missiles here in a second. And you can also turn on this little overview that helps you... Oh! Oh crap, it's moving, it's happening. We turn on the overview and we find out he's still got some of his health left. He's got 340 left. Oh, that's gonna be it. I think it's game over. Sunk already. Our ship's just fine. So, that was kind of anticlimactic because we were going to win that. But when you have a massive battle with battleships and carriers and fleets and all kinds of crazy things, it's cool to watch every once in a while. You don't have to watch it every time. In fact, I watch it very rarely because I've seen them before. But when it's a very important battle, I like to watch. It has adds some tension. So we greet her in the name of the four families. Ah, that's the one that we are about to go to war with. Increased population. We built some things. Hmm. Yeah, Labelli's, if you like the civilization style um, game, if you like the whole history and the you know nations, you know, on Earth, as far as theme is based, more than the Space 4X. I would suggest uh, Civ 5 because you can get that whole thing super cheap on these bundles when they come up. Um, and it is quite good, especially with, with when you get with the two expansions. Like I said, you can get a super cheap, like five bucks. You can get the full Civ 5 bundle on any of these sales that they have. And at the same time, you can, uh, you know, wait for Civ 6 to get a little better and have its first expansion. In addition, there is a mod that I highly recommend for Civ 5 called Vox Populi, also known as the Community Patch Project. And out of all the different 4Xs that I have, I would say that one is my favorite period. Civ 5 with the Vox Populi mod is the best one that I know of, especially because the AI in that game is actually quite clever. The AI in the in the endless games has been its weakness. Its design has always been really good. The AI has been weak. The multiplayer capability of these games is really good. They've done a good job making the multiplayer interface really good, really tight, giving you all kinds of options. Um, all right, so we have to choose our new... Hmm. What do we determine? We're weak on production possibilities here. Plus two resource generation on strategic resource deposits. That'll increase our strategic resource production. We want this one. We want predictive logistics, just flat plus 20 production to planets and plus happiness because of luxuries. Yep, that's the one I want. We're also going to have, ooh, because we went on that major political uh, uh, military buildup, the, the militarists have gained a lot of ground here against the industrialists. Oh, we discovered the homeworld. Of those guys there. Let's leave it immediately. Fortune smiles. For Horatio is willing to speak with you. This guy. This guy. He was a trillionaire. And he is so narcissistic. He believes himself to be the perfect being in the universe. So when he went out and explored and found a ton of 
ancient cloning technology. He fired it up and built an entire race of duplicates. The Horatio race is entirely composed of people that are exact copies of Horatio. It's it's just, I freaking love that. I love that. That's so unique. I haven't heard that as a sci-fi trope anywhere else. I'm I'm sure it's done, done before, but I still like it. All right, so we're immediately leaving these guys homeworld because I don't want them to get mad at me yet. Yet. We'll we'll do that on our own. Uh, and we're going to research another two curiosities here on this planet. There's a lot of curiosities in this little planet. Ooh, plus 150 dust. We've got a lot of dust stocked up now. <gasps> Basic perfected slugs. More projectile damage and short range at that. Hmm. So we have a couple of possibilities. After that one, maybe we increase the strength of our ships. We can't do it. Not until we get something else on this level. Hmm. Well, I think we need to take Xenology in order to get new heroes started. But this is really good, too. Darnock University? It's a unique, isn't it? Yeah. It can only be built once. And it lets us colonize barren planets. Huh. 509 versus 679. I really want more, more heroes to govern my planet, so I'm gonna go with that. Oh, 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 okay. Endless Legend is a good place to go from Endless Space. They share a lot in common. You're gonna be very comfortable there. Soon Essa is finally going to become our uh, our planet. Each each ship that's being sent there, you can see there are three ships. This one started moving like a gajillion turns ago. And it still hasn't, the first ship hasn't reached it yet. I wish there was an upgrade to make those ships move faster. Hmm. We talked about this earlier. Once you reach 10, the industrialists get even more industrial. The effects granted by collecting population units of this kind is increased. Hmm. What else we get? More Imperials. Where's our scout? What did he find down here? He's still on the way. What about our other scout? Didn't we have another scout? He's on he's en route. Oh, that's right, he's en route to the middle of the galaxy. We can spend a little time talking a bit more about these interfaces that we haven't discussed yet. You can see here, F7 is the quest log. You can see the current quest. You can pin a specific one up to the top right, make it easier to track. Um, and you can see the active events on your empire. We've also got the hero list, which also shows how you can get new heroes. And we'll get to that when we um, when we build up the thing that gets us new heroes. Hmm. We don't need more food here. I don't know what this does. Hmm. Endless Research Park and Endless World. This is the one where you have to build it before anybody else. It's, it's like a wonder. We could try to build it, right? What's the worst that can happen? No, we don't, we don't want to. We want to build more military from here. Ah, you know what we want? Public-private partnerships. This will significantly improve our science outcome here. And now... Shorty, the short-range ship. We want to pick the attacker. Th 
35, only effective at short range. But man, is it going to be effective. And then we're going to add... Well, we know that the pirates are hitting us with energy. Yeah, let's put energy defenses on the ship. Finally, we have to give it the, the old extra speed boost. All right. We have a new ship design that we can build and add to our fleet. One, two, three. No, let's do two. Yeah, we can do three. And now we can introduce you to another cool thing. Every hero has a ship when they are assigned to a fleet. And we can make his ship whatever we want. Let's make him a long-range guy. I think this is also a long-range, but energy gives us more possibilities to punch the enemy. Punch the keys, for God's sake! Uh, and we'll give one of each of the defensive modules, and then as... We do have room to put another support module on. Uh, he will help us siege down things. He has, like, the mass drivers that help us siege. That's pretty good. Yeah, I'm all about that. So we've just paid, now his ship is upgraded. Oh, we can use Void Stone now. We've discovered Void Stone somewhere in the galaxy. Hmm. The Lord of War. Black markets have always existed in dense urban centers, blah, blah, blah. Black markets for illegal firearms are another matter, especially when it enables enemy civilizations to get their hands, tentacles, or other appendages on some of the Empire's most effective weaponry. Unfortunately, the truth is that some of your un undercover security forces have unearthed comp compelling evidence that a gun smuggling ring is operating out of three of your systems, and the leader is suspected to be the nephew of Duke Groltz, a bad apple with history of criminal activity. Do we shut down the ring, or do we let them stay? Honestly, uh, getting that many heroes is going to be difficult at the moment. We're only just getting to research the ability to get more. And we need all three of them to have a hero. Well, it's certainly possible, but... 60 happiness might be easier. We can build a few buildings and make that happen. Ugh, she doesn't like us. Well, that's okay, we're planning to kill her. Uh, so this is our main capital guy. I made him a little bit better at fighting if he has to, but I'm going to make him better at collecting dust next. 20% of the galaxy has been explored. Fantastic. Yep, we did all that. All right, let's keep getting more curiosities. We know we want to do that to complete this mission. Ooh, a smart survivor's battle tactic. We can actually go in and check the battle tactics soon. Um, what about these other guys? We still can't choose this. We need 75%, huh? Is this the one I just clicked on? Ah. There we go. Now it's plus four for ten turns. That should get us to right where we need to go. And we'll get both of these guys added to our faction, hopefully. Wow, this one has taken forever to build it. Anything. Huh. Even with the friendly locals, it's growing very slowly. Alright, we've discovered this system here, but all the curiosities have already been explored. But at least if we explore a little more here, we might get some more ideas of how strong they are as a faction. And we're going to wait for him to get his curiosity research back there. Now, this is a standard, standard length game. 
Oh! <laughs> We've already completed this. I didn't even have to go. We've already got people that are happy. Ubiquitous surveillance got picked up. Okay. We finally got our outpost turning into a colony way up here. And this is going to be an amazing system, eventually. In the meantime, we need to get it started. And I think we're going to need sustainable farms here because this is the only planet that's going to be producing any food. So we're going to go to there next. All right. Now, this one... It has a decent amount of food production at this one here. Nine? Yeah, that's that's okay. And this is also going to have its own decent amount of food production. We probably don't need to put sustainable farms on here. You know what? We can put it on here and then tear it down later. Uh, but the thing that we need is production. This Terran planet's not that great for production, apparently. It's only three. Uh, fertile, though. It's temperate. So let's do that. I'm actually going to spend half of my dust building that in a single turn to make this grow faster. Ah, I forgot we built this settler in a single turn. Uh, I need to send him to Janus. Now, is Geysar able to supply food to Janus? It's currently colonizing over there. Uh, if we build this... Quickly, and I'm out of dust. I just I blew it all in that turn. But oh, okay. Hmm. Industrialists and militarists are very likely to be the choice. I'm still going to throw my weight behind the ecologists because they help growth and expansion. Or no, let's throw it behind the militarists. Let's see what happens. All right, they're voting. They're voting. Industry's going way out front. Yep, it's going to be industry then military by a hair. And you can tell, actually, there's been there's a bit of a coalition. When uh, the empires realize they're not one of the top two, they join one of the top two. So the industrialists got the votes of the scientists and the pacifists, and the militarists got the votes of the religious. I think it's got a set default. We didn't get any new laws, and we didn't get any action changes, so it looks like it's just the same. The militarists gained... Uh, so we did get new law, technically. The militarists are now in power instead of the... Who was it before? It was the pacifists? But now we have the militarist laws. Lower fleet costs. Seems like a good thing to me. It costs one influence per population, which currently would be 19 per turn, but I think it's worth it. So we're getting a little less influence per turn, but I, I like it. All right, so we're building three of those. And hoping that one fleet is enough. We're going to build that, and then we're going to build one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. A second fleet of seven. Just in case the first one gets destroyed. Got to have a backup plan. What is Iron Harvest? Chad is asking me about Iron Harvest. Release date 2019. An RTS. Oh, yeah, I have seen this. No, I'm not really interested in anything that takes place in World War I, much less steampunk, to be honest. Five per luxury deposit, huh? I like that. And we can now build those extra valuable things. Now, specializations is something that we haven't talked about yet. Which planet might be valuable to show that off on? Do we have a hot planet? No, they're all temperate, aren't they? Well, um, once you start unlocking specializations, they are things that you can put into effect in one turn. It takes one turn to build them. Two turns, I guess, looks like this time. Um, and they increase the effectiveness of a planet towards a very specific thing. In this case, I can make each person's planet give plus one production. 
because of unlock industrial zones. This specialization works better on hot planets. The uh, science specialization works better on cold planets. The dust specialization works better on sterile planets. And the food specialization works better on fertile planets. And beyond that, there are a lot of other specializations that are based on different things. So here's an example of another specialization that is industry-based, but it doesn't give you industry. It gives you extra resource production. I believe that covers both strategic and luxury. So go figure. And here's one that's a better version of the lower level dust specialization that you can see here. One plus one on sterile, and this is two plus two on sterile. So... Yeah, I mean, you can see uh, where would be the science one right here. Yep, one plus one on cold, and then it gets better. Cancels the negative effects of mist anomalies. That's not the same thing. Uh, I'm guessing. Yeah, there's the two, two plus two on cold. Unlocks the exploration of moons. And then this is plus one uh, influence. So you can see there's specializations for... Pretty much everything. Um, food specialization is... Where is food specialization? Is it here? 